to work at the Metropolitan University of Educational Sciences in Chile. Dr. Paulette, you have the floor. A very good morning to you all. I would like to start my presentation today by offering a warm greeting to you all. Good morning, Greci Fuentes, Secretary of Culture of Ibagué. Maria Parias, Maria Claudia Parias, the Executive Director of Fundación Batuta. Thank you very much for this invitation. It is an enormous honor to be here with you. I would also like to send a greeting to those of you who were affected by the river that flooded last week. I would like to start my presentation with a summary. I am Carlos Poblet de Lagos and I am a music professor as well as performer and hold a doctoral degree in educational sciences. And I look at music and musical education as well as cultural aspects. So in this presentation, I would like to talk about culture and cultural differences and the reach that this may have in musical education, particularly in Latin America. The idea of this conference is to look at the need to have adequate analytical tools that apply to the Latin American context and reality that enable, at the same time, the ability to have dialogues with people in different territories, always ensuring equality. These are dialogues also must be directly tied to the Latin American context. Just as we've seen from Beethoven or Bach or Stravinsky, we see that residents enjoy this music as well as traditional music by musicians such as Violeta Parras. I will look at pedagogical activities, experience, and mass imagination looking at how these are related to the cadence of different media. I'll look at tonality, language, and orchestral colors. I will talk about how we feel the blood rushing through our bodies to the rhythms of traditional mestiza rhythms. I have divided my presentation into three sections. And if time permits, I will also give a space for questions to be asked. I would like to start with this first segment to talk about the complexity of the situation at hand, sharing an anecdote with you. Some months ago, at the end of June, I had to present at a conference, an, an international sociology conference to be more precise. And, of course, there was a Q&A space, as tends to occur, and a colleague said to me, okay, fantastic, congratulations. That was an excellent presentation. Everything's very clear. But, but I have a doubt. Why do we need another cultural model? Just one more. Why do we need even more? And I have to confess that I was not expecting this question. <coughs> but I tried to respond by talking about complexity or complexities of the cultural narrative in Latin America. That for many of my colleagues who live in what we often refer to as the first world, it's not always easy to understand this reality. It's not always so easy to understand the logics that we combine our practices and worldviews and our ways of relating with another as well as our way of doing or performing and teaching music. I tried to explain the need to have a specific lens to read the Latin American reality through. And as I said previously, it's necessary that we are aware of these complexities. 
and we need to move away from Eurocentric perspectives, in my humble opinion. We don't need to rely on models that have been previously built. I would like to start by giving context, looking at this complexity, and from there, explaining the need to construct a new model. I must here signal that this whole conference is based on what I call musical education, what we know as musical education. Nonetheless, for the effect of this conference and also the research project I'm conducting, we must look at this as a broad space that involves not only processes, so formal education processes, <coughs> those that take place in the classroom, but also informal processes and spaces that are essentially informal that have not even yet been conceived of as spaces for education. Info. And when we look at Fundación Batuta and practices of musical educators as well as students, as students, many of us were able to perceive or we are able to see that when one of our students starts to play music in his or her home, it's not only that student who receives transformation. Simply sharing a space means that the relationship with daily life or with this new form of music starts to have an impact on ways of learning. We see very visible changes in family groups because the family is involved, for example, in daily rehearsals, practice, instrumental care. Uh, later on, they may attend concerts. And all of this starts to generate an impact that is translated into learning. Learning that is not mediated by the direct intention to teach. In the example that I'm giving, let's say the case of a child who is studying music and is learning in front of their family. The family is not directly receiving a musical education, but they indirectly do receive one. So if we broaden the concept of the informal, when it comes to musical education, we can arrive at this conclusion. So that's what I wanted to start with. Usually when we think of Latin America, there are a series of historical, social and cultural factors that lead to contemporary problems and tensions. Firstly, I would like to draw your attention to three historical factors that are part of the sociocultural fabric of Latin America. We have a relatively short Republican history, it's only around 200 years old. And we start to see that the social fabric that we reproduce has been inherited from the colonial times. We also have systematic development, though partial, of the state as a democratic body. But with different evolutions, we have had Republican participation in the Republic. However, Social participation processes have not been fully included, which is necessary for complete development. And thirdly, we have the historical coexistence of multiple layers in this social fabric. We have migrant Creole and native communities, and of course, mestizos. All of these groups share physical, political, and symbolic space. And it all occurs at the same time in multiple transversal relationships. And so when we look at cultural analysis, you also look at multiple territorial and field dimensions in which situations and contexts of a multicultural nature coexist. And we also have practices that become transcultural. And all of these, of course, are cross-cut by these historical factors in the socio-cultural context at the macro and the micro levels. 
we also have contemporary tensions. Local and global tensions, these affect the practices and meanings that we give to our daily life. And this has an impact on the cultural track record of our peoples and communities as well as the region. In this contemporary sphere, we can, for example, look at local tensions. We can see the emergence of internal conflicts and their impacts on the governability of countries in the region. At the same time, we have enormous socioeconomic inequality and the issues that are derived based on the gross domestic product of each country. We have important relationships between locals and foreign communities. We also look at an important redefinition of the rights of indigenous communities. And this translates into a demand for profound social transformation in our country. We also have to look at the global situation. For example, we can see the issues that we have when it comes to the modernization of communication technologies, as well as the structural weaknesses of modern economic neoliberalism, which was already suffering greatly before the COVID-19 pandemic. And all of this has been aggravated by the environmental conditions that have been aggravated by climate change. This whole con context and this crossover between the past and the present, local and global tradition and mestizo traditions need, means that we need a model, a cultural model, that can include these dualities or that are based around these cultural aspects. Or we must overcome the separation between colonizers and those who've been culturally colonized. Some considerations about culture. This can seem to be paradoxical. Speaking about culture in the present day can seem to be con complex. When it comes to cultural references, we refer back to daily practices associated with social hereditary aspects, for example, artistic practices, play, work, etc., the way that we dress, etc. And on the other hand, these may be associated with certain communities, regions, etc. We also have a lot of definitions that have historically existed when it comes to culture. Some people understand culture as everything that man does or specialized practices, communication, representation, etc. Despite the continuous conceptual development, we recognize tradition as a central aspect of the definition of culture. We also have a heritage based concept of culture. Following this line of reasoning, Apadurai refers to the problematic definition of culture because it opens the door to the biological aspect and fails to look at points of difference. And it is an effort to construct an us. As a response, Apadurai refers to the need to form adjectives that privileges the idea of what is cultural over the idea of culture. And so he looks at culture as an aspect of phenomena and that looks at the differences that we have incarnated, looking at cooperative differences and looking at culture as difference, which at the same time is an omnipresent element in human discourse so that we can exploit difference to generate diverse conceptions of group identity. Other factors. <laughs> and so we have to also look at the need to make visible differences and, define, and reinforce them even more. And so in, along this line of reasoning, we must look at the fluidity of change. 
looking at the events that occur in the relationships between cultures over time. These have an impact on the texts that we use as symbols of the cultures that differentiate us. And so we must look at what is real as what is relational. We must overcome dualities and look at the micro, meso and macro levels by applying key concepts, for example, customs and social space. And so culture emerges as the result of a series of events and processes. And so these may be reflected in daily ways of life and customs. So this is reaffirmed in colonial and imperialist models. Homi Baba also requests or suggests that we must look at spaces for interrelationship where we have a negotiation of the intersubjective and collective ideas of nationality, community interest, and cultural value. This is an interstitial space where we see an articulation of difference, whether this is based on either consensual or conflictive elements, looking at tradition and modernity and the tension that exists between the two, looking at the habits that occur both in private and public spaces and in high and low culture. Our Argentine Mexican sociologist goes even further, Néstor García Canclini. He highlights the hybrid nature that relational processes possess when it comes to constructing a Latin American cultural account. And so when it comes to a strict and linear idea of culture, well, we must replace this with a complex relational and knowledge model that is open to assimilation and exchange, looking at ideas that come from other places. We need to look at a hybridization model that understands cultural transference processes, looking at European and American origin traditions, looking at modernity and post-modernity, looking at the relationship between urban and rural populations in the same nation, establishing a perspective that puts mestizo culture at the center as something fundamental for the idea of creating a new articulated concept of culture. In this relational perspective on culture, we must pay attention to the role that history plays. We, we have the macro, meso, and micro levels of social readings, but with different levels of historical time or different rhythms of historical time. And we must look at the relationships that exist when it comes to constructing this social network and culture, looking at a collective narrative that has a past and looking at practices that are upon which a culture or society is built. In any case, a critique of this logic is not so much about clarity or belonging when it comes to the relational facet. We need to look at the most conservative conceptions of culture and the materialization and set of practices from different parts of society. Bordeaux conceives of culture as a series of practices in the social space. And this means that within this space, independent of the relational nature of what is occurring, we also need to look at those positions that not only name or create a named form of culture, but we must also look at how operational systems are formed based on habits, lifestyles that are specific to individuals and communities. I refer, for example, to the consideration of people who are dedicated to traditional music. For example, folk music, handicrafts, etc. This is something that is not only, or music here is not only part of the conservative definition of culture, but the definition of music tends to be very conservative. When we point to culture exclusively as something that can be 
described through an adjective, but through relationships, we start to ask ourselves, how are we also referring to those who engage in culture, not only from an intellectual perspective, but also build their lives based on these visions, departing from a more cultural a conservative, rigid idea of culture. We cannot ignore the fact that this is part of this collective group that we refer to as culture. So in this sense, without ignoring the way that social processes, of course, lead to production, circulation, and consumption of cultural products, when it comes to intercultural, interstitial cultural exchange spaces, as Homi Baba says, this could paradoxically make invisible those more conservative positions that are also part of culture, as mentioned previously. And from here emerges the idea of coming up with a new model. And we have one central question to respond to here. How can we have a cultural model that allows us to structurally analyze the culture, cultural aspects but also involving this, these dual judgments that we see occurring in interstitial spaces, looking at difference as a central element of culture and not something marginal, and that can be used when it comes to analyzing musical practices and policies. I would like to propose a definition of culture. Culture should be understood as macro contents and narrative dimensions as well as territorial dimensions. These may dynamically and through relationships change, and they are a product of the actions of both individual and community actions. These dimensions are impacted both individually and together due to the relationship between time and context. At the same time, this framework is an open regulatory tool that is built by the series of either objective or random possibilities for interactions between people and communities based on their distinct cultural repertoires and reservoirs. This goes across territorial and narrative practices. We have a certain grammar that refers to context and time that are recorded for each community. The model that I am working on is constituted of three fundamental dimensions. First off, the narrative dimension, which refers to an organization of content, whether these be objects or practices that are built within a defined territory based on the individual interactions that occur between community members. These are affected by the temporal contextual facet, and there are redefinitions based on the passing of time looking at the way in which communities and individuals define and understand their ways of life. Additionally, we have a territorial dimension, which is based on different delimited areas defined by the community. These may be physical spaces, political spaces, and or symbolic spaces, and at the same time may be overlapping manifestations or may be organized into multiple layers. Each one of the components of this territorial dimension is affected by context, resignification, broadening, connectivity between dimensions, areas, and layers. An objectual dimension in the end that it comprises this group of material and symbolic contents and territories and that are used in, to articulate every cultural dimension, both material and symbolic objects that can be isolated or confirm chains even between different dimensions. I speak like, for example, tools, technological devices or concepts or pieces of art or even deities. High historical milestones, all of these are within this conception, objects. And those objects themselves, as they articulate their sense, that generate processes, algorithms, complex machines, systems of beliefs, scientific and aesthetic languages, etc.
This close link between objects, practices, and ways of life linked to certain narratives and territories make this dimension to become gravity with respect to the other two, because it's the objective reference that conforms the identity of a community. This gravitational condition, a long time, can be acknowledged with reference to the patrimonial character of culture as a group of elements that need to be valued as representative of an identity and a territory in order to be preserved and tired. They are central, but they're just one of the dimensions. As I said before, this is also affected by the relationship between the time and the context. The relationship between time and context that has also been defined as historical time, it's also called Zeitgeist by Kaus, has a certain effect on culture this relationship permeates the whole model in a description that assumes critically the understanding of past time in accordance to the conditions on which it was built. Thus, time and context affect the territorial dimension by redefining physical limits and political limits of each area by expansion or contraction, re-signifying the symbolic nature of the limits between territories. In the case of objectual dimension, time affects the usability of objects as a fruit or a consequence of the changes in the ways of life of a certain community in a certain time. For example, let's uh, just think about the change of cassettes. I think many of us can remember what was a, what a cassette was. We moved from that to the CD and then on to digital formats. Then the vinyl and the cassette reappeared afterwards as a representative element within a vintage culture. This way in which time affects, in this case, the objectionable dimension, implies a change of use, of course, which in times takes us to reject some of these things. This happened, as, as I said before, the case of the vinyl record and the set, a resignification. That resignification is, of course, part of that operation or that way to affect the relationship between time and context within this dimension. In the case of the narrative dimension, time and context are affected more evidently or more significantly for what we recognize usually from culture or of a culture in particular. First of all, regarding the selection of individual stories and the appearance of new ones that modify the semantic characteristics of that semantic of culture. Number two, in a complex log that integrates territory and objects, the relationship between time and context affects the narrative when in front of natural evolution of time and disputes for the control of territory between cultures. Now these dynamics are marked by the paths of time and the ways in which set context that operates as a general framework is modified. Number three, and once again going back to uh, territory, time, context. This can be seen from different planes, broadening or contracting a certain space. And also in accordance to the main characteristics of this space, for example. Let's think about, I know we're talking about Latin America, but the clearest example that I can come up with is related to Germany, German culture. We can recognize uh, a number of examples and elements that uh, takes us to 
a certain way of life that can be characterized from different places. And so historical processes and different narratives, many of them are built from otherness in the case of disputes among Catholics and Protestants here, but also in the emergence of language and specialized language, poetry, philosophy, music, science. All of this, if we mention uh, the German culture in general, but if, for example, we contract this space, this narrative, this territory, and we focus on a smaller portion of the territory within Germany, we can acknowledge different territories and definitions of otherness from different nuclei around the territories and the characteristics and limits that have been defined throughout time. For example, the difference between Bavarians and Saxons and Thuringians, or Protestants and Catholics, and even closer to us in time, among those that belonged to the uh, East Germany, or those that lived in the, we uh, in the, west, in, in the west of Germany. Among them, the relationship has been quite tense, in spite of unification. This weekend, I think it's 30-something anniversary of this unification. So in spite of that, the division is very patent. And as it becomes interiorized of these narratives and within the territorial space, you can recognize these differences. Now, this can operate also in the inverse if we apply the map of culture narratives. We can identify small regions, but we can also identify broader regions, for example, that includes Germany, Austria, Czechia, which is different from a Balkanic culture. And if we talk about Europe or West and East or North and South, these are all logics that are completely applicable to our continent, to our Latin America. And so time is an articulating El intérprete se disculpa. So it becomes an axis that defines the framework on which we can build this cultural grammar of a certain community. I would like to share some implications for music education. The model that I mentioned before allows us to characterize the different dimensions that participate in culture and cultural difference within music education. In my opinion, we lose the perspective of educational policies for those who teach music in different territories. At the same time, it allows us to organize musical practice and contents as a function of the narrative that is at the base of repertoires and contexts. This also allows us to characterize these practices according to the physical, political, and symbolic territories that relate to repertoires and contexts. This allows us to identify guidelines that are objectivized around the vision on culture that are at the base of teaching policies and practices to identify possible ways to signify and re-signify content. And finally, this allows us to analyze how time affects each one of these elements according to the context, the social-cultural context. Now let's discuss about music education in Latin America. In my opinion, even though this work is ongoing, I believe that this model can coadjuvate 
to create an exit for this dualistic perception on our musical identity that so often is debated between East and West and post-colonial positions to develop genres and repertoires and types of music. These are thematic discussions that are visible nowadays from study plans in music schools and training for teachers and even concert halls through the programming of orchestras and music groups. Discussions that are visible in all these examples, but that are that do not pay attention to the intercultural nature of our uh, Latin American cultural identity that is always changing, moving from narratives and contexts and time and identity, all framed within a certain condition and a certain multicultural space. On the other hand, together with this revaluation of music and its role as an area that is capable to propose strategies to strengthen attitudes and dispositions of respect towards difference, or that generates intercultural conversations and reflections, this considers a special role of teachers and trainers mostly around the work, around the relationship of music, culture, and diversity. Number one, this, the implication of these agents in the analysis and discussion of political uh, aspects of education. For example, Kiltwerke, Gertzen, and Katzen. These reflections of the relationships of power between policies, agents, and agency, local and global communities, all of this resounds in what Schmidt mentioned regarding the need to participate in the knowledge of educational policies, but from political action and participation, from the commitment assumed, not just from a contemplative plan, but also questioning them. Number two. This role must also account for the need for constant, constant attention and a deep interpretation of these contexts where musicians and teachers live to analyze and create a critical dialogue of these relationships and the characteristics of the context where they carry out their duties. This is subscribed also within a certain political action that is linked to knowledge that should make an active part of evaluation and transmission of knowledge and from the relationship between peers, especially with colleagues. Now we also have, we also face a challenge for this third sector from the guidelines that inspire the labor of the so-called third sector, NGOs and non-profits that developed, that have developed a vital activity for the social and cultural life of our communities, but also to generate spaces for relationships and coexistence to connect cultural realities that are separate by class or economic values or cultural values. In this case, we face a dual challenge. Number one, the definition I was saying that this first challenge lies on the definition of certain work lines to incorporate inclusion and cultural diversity as an essential part of each NGO's work, not just as a principle of theory, but 
axes that can be effectively articulated on each level on which the organization is built, from directive levels to directive to operation and administrative levels, from training to acting, and of course from the repertoires that have been selected for music activity to the participation of communities and people to whom these repertoires are presented. Number two, the deepening of what it means with and for culture, inclusion and diversity. This does not only imply a stylish representation of traditional repertoires or concerts in different social cultural contexts. This really means acknowledgement of inherent difference in each context, trying to enrich the repertoires of cultures and of participants. This also means to assume this commitment to open windows to knowledge from visualization that is comprehensive and filled with love of difference, built on convergence and interpersonal and intercommunity relationships. All of these are fundamental dimensions for music, for personal development, and for communities that participate. And as I said before, they have deep effects on the integration of different groups in which our social space is divided. In the end, I speak about building new ways to live and new ways to act, trying to contribute to develop new principles of social cohesion based on reflective recognition of otherness as a central part of our own identity. Let me just finish this presentation thanking again the authorities, Grace Fuentes, Dr. Maria Claudia Parias, Fondacion Batuta, and all our participants. Once again, thank you very much. I would like to use this minutes to open the floor to questions. So if you have any questions, we can discuss. Good morning, everyone. Carlos, thank you for this very pertinent presentation that presents the complexity of culture and culture and musical education and that invites us to think about the role of teachers within music education contexts that emphasize on social transformation of territories of communities and where we see children as subjects of rights that can do a real contribution and significant contribution in these processes. For Batuta, many of these elements that you have mentioned have been projected and we have reflected and we have generated these reflections and practices where we can allow a more territorial focus and to identify which are those elements that allows us to empower children and communities through and from music. So I was um, very impressed by what you presented and I would like to to elaborate a little bit more on the relationship between music education and education for peace among contexts that are so complex as this Colombian context where we have the armed conflict but where also the pandemic is so present and is a huge challenge in our territorial processes. Well, thank you very much for that question. Thank you for your comments and your attention and your time. I must say that your question is so pertinent and so complex to answer. However, when I was beginning my presentation, I referenced the complexity and as part of that complexity, one of the dimensions that constituted and that make part of our everyday life in Latin America, the emergence of conflict that is painful, such as the one that you mentioned. How, how, how long was the conflict? I think it was 50 years, if I'm not wrong, in Colombia, yes. And that ended with this peace accord in 2016 
which I understand. We're just implementing, and it's just its fifth anniversary, I think it was last Sunday. So yes, of course, I'd like to, to mention this very respectfully. From a theoretical academic position, we can have a look at the human dimension that it underlies this conflict. But I mention this because I do believe that the work that we can do as teachers and educators at any level, at any plane, formally, non-formally, and informally, this necessarily must reach two dimensions. One first dimension that is a part of the activity. that is always present within us, and that's opening spaces for knowledge, in this case, music knowledge, to open opportunities for expression, but also to understand these forms and ways and systems of thought that are not being incorporated within our context. Let me uh, step aside for a minute. I mean, not just incorporating mm, popular and traditional or indigenous music. That's fine, of course. But we should also do the inverse movement to open those communities that do not have access to classical music or Occidental tradition music, open spaces so that they can access it. But at the same time, there's a second dimension that is precisely. Uh, something that reaches that human dimension. As educators and as teachers, we have the need to come together with other people from that dimension through the creation of spaces for integration and coexistence. I would like to give an example. We need to be born and grow up in a certain context. That was my context. It was a little bit oppressive and it was full of pain. And I remember that music constituted a safe place for me. It was a safe territory for me. This was a territory where we could share and express ourselves. We were able to feel that we were a part of this identity. So you asked me about the role of educators in music education. For me, it is building that safe space that will allow these forms of knowledge. Educators, conductors, musicians, they're all fundamental to build an identity. In the meantime, we should work hard and with patience, because this change will not take five or ten years, probably. Rebuilding those wounds will take a lot longer. Thank you. Dr. Paulette, greetings in the name of the Ministry of Culture. Thank you for your presentation. I would just like to mention one point, because you answered the already question I had, and it's the fact that in Colombia we understand the topic that you mentioned about traditional music and this encounter with Occidental music through a program that's called Sand Territories that started in 2011. These are young policies. In 93, Law 70 was created that promotes black communities and the exercise of rights, of social and musical rights. And in that sense, we have come a long way as a ministry. However, there is something that you mentioned that's really, really important. It's opening dialogue from the Western aspect or common practice or whatever you call it from music conservatives, but how we have also been very conservative with indigenous and Afro communities and to ensure access for them to knowledge and how technology, social processes, migration, are very important 
to build and rebuild that social fabric. On that topic, I would like to ask whether they have more repertoire or recommendations, because we have many experiences from the West towards the communities, but not the other way around, opening that knowledge to our communities. Susanna, thank you very much for your question. The truth is that I am not, I, I cannot give recipes. I don't feel uh, that I can, but I could mention perhaps that for me, this process of change and construction with respect to the way we relate to communities, what we call otherness, you mentioned the black community. In my country, I can speak about the black community, but mainly the indigenous community. And so, number one, this consideration towards these repertoires <laughs> begins by, it can sound like cliche, but we need to recognize that other kind of knowledge that is just as valuable that we need to access with the same level of respect. Acknowledging that difference in that case implies acknowledging the value, the intrinsic value of these different ways of that community and its particularly outlook on the universe. And that is the beginning. Music we can discuss later. If not, it can be paradoxic. I'm just going to end on this note. There was a a recent project that I did with uh, music teachers in my country. A uh, well-intentioned teacher, he uh, said that uh, at a cultural work, he worked with the Mapuche indigenous culture, the, the largest group in our country of all in indigenous communities. And for him, it's cultural work focused just on being able to play. Fi I think it was the 1812 overture by Tchaikovsky by incorporating within the orchestra musical instruments that came from the Mapuche tradition. Well, that is, yes, a step forward. But it is an anecdotal fact that is not an encounter. Do we really value that other culture? Do we really know that those instruments that are incorporated whether they have religious or ritual value, not just what we consider them, objects, any instrument can be just used. So I think we need to realize that at the base of everything, there's this need to face the painful value to approach difference, but from a humane point of view. Once we build that bond, we can move forward. That is my answer. Hopefully, I have answered your question. Okay. We have another question for Dr. Poblete. Good morning. How are you? We've been discussing, having discussions during lunch and during the breaks that we've had here at the seminar, and we've been speaking a great deal with people who are responsible for music training of children, adolescents and youths here. So how can we guarantee that this inclusion is in fact honored and that diversity is respected? And at the same time, how can we guarantee quality training and ensure equity? We're talking about including communities, vulnerable children, etc. But how can we guarantee that the quality of education offered and the musical training given is the same for everybody and that they have the opportunity to receive the best possible training? Thank you very much for your question. So I understand that you are referring to positive 
discrimination, so to speak. Because I'm not sure if I clearly understood the question. Yes. Yes, Dr. Paulete. I think that you have to be clear as to what it is that we are after. You know, when we talk about these two aspects, there are two areas we need to look at integration and respect for the other. But at the same time, there is a very important role to be played when it comes to musical development when it comes to ensuring training for all communities. I think that the rigor that each conductor and teacher brings to their practice when these spaces are opened has to be the same for everybody. With no distinction. Because I believe that positive discrimination is also a kind of paternalistic approach because we're dictating how people should relate to culture. We are also others from other groups. We also want to receive rigorous training. Additionally, it's actually important to look at the different spaces we have to reflect as teachers, as conductors, etc. And that's why we have to have this coordination access. And I think Fundacion Batuta, I've read a little about the history of your foundation and you do exceptional work. And if we were to provide Fundacion Batuta as an example for others, we would need to say these are not only guidelines, when it comes to the mission statement and the vision, but that this really needs to be truly incorporated. We need to really interiorize this. And we need to prioritize training. And in doing so, we are working on the right level. And in this way, we are teaching music in the most rigorous and appropriate fashion for everybody, ensuring equality under equal conditions on an even playing field. And this is also related to how we establish and deepen our relationships. How do we weave our interpersonal history? This has to be something inherent to the teaching practice. Thank you very much, Dr. Poblete. Thank you. I'd just like to say once again, thank you very much. I believe the points you have mentioned are extremely important. And there are models to be followed in Latin America, for example, Batuta. But I would like to know what experiences you have had over your career. What recommendations you could you give us or what other uh, role model projects could we follow, not only in Latin America? For example, you just you just referred to the need to look at repertoires, to have educational meeting spaces. I don't know if there's been an effort made, for example, um, an, a specific effort around repertoires and equity. Yes, I believe that it is. Let me respond with a general answer. Unfortunately, time will not allow us to have a very extensive conversation on this topic. My my only recommendation, because I'm not a man of formulas, as I've already said, is to look at what's being done in focal points of conflict. In Colombia, there are people who are working arduously. I spoke about the Mapuche communities in the south of Chile, and there is a foundation working in that area which has orchestras in different parts of the country and works with young people. And Alejandra Riva <coughs> is the conductor, the director of this program. 
and this is located around 800 kilometers to the south of Santiago. And she works with Mapuche children, children who are in an environment in which they are usually violated when it comes to their security and their ability to live in peace. This is an example of the work being done by a Chilean academic and professional. We also have Jorge Peña Pen, and he was the pioneer when it came to thinking of music and looking at music to work with communities who did not have access to music due to scarcity of resources. His task, or the work that he did rather, was absolutely groundbreaking when it came to looking at the system. We've also seen work done in Venezuela and how this system has been replicated in other places. The only thing I could do, Susana, is recommend that you pay close attention pay close attention to conflict zones, what's being done there, to determine what needs to be done. And I would like to draw attention to work that is done by the National Music Foundation that works in more than 80 countries. The current president is an African woman, and there are a lot of systematized investigative or research experiences, as well as intercultural projects that has been carried out through musical education. So that could be an interesting source of information. I would be happy to share links and references with you if you need them. I can email those to you or can share the information with Maria Claudia. Thank you very much. Dr. Paulette, thank you very much for being with us this morning. We will continue, it is 9.58 in the morning. We would like to greet those of you who are joining us here at the auditorium at Tolima University, as well as those of you who are connected through the virtual link www.simts.co. Anybody from anywhere in the world can have free access to all of the content, this very valuable content at the second international seminar on music and social transformation. We will now move on to our last in-depth interview in which we will hear from Mark Bamuti Joseph, who currently serves as Vice President and Artistic Director of Social Impact at the Kennedy Center in Washington. Some of his projects include works done for the Perelman Center, the National Opera of Washington, and also between the world and me on HBO. He has also received the Social Practice Guggenheim Initiative and worked at the program head and educational head at YBCA in San Francisco. Grace, the interview will be given by Catalina Ceballos, who is here with us on site. Thank you very much, Catalina, for being here with us. She is a Colombian anthropologist with a major in international resource management. She has more than 23 years of experience in strategic design of cultural and media projects. She was the deputy director of the ITBC radio station, also worked on Channel 13 and worked as the cultural consultant for the AN University in Bogota. She has worked on communication media and artistic projects. She is currently communications consultant for the Truth Commission. She directs and streams her podcast on Cero Setenta Art Setenta, where she researches and speaks with very significant individuals from the arts and culture sector. From here around the world, Catalina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria, Claudia, and Grace. Thank you to those of us who are joining us here on site. Hi, hola, Mark. Buenos dias, como estas? Hi, Mark. I see you. Hey, 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 hey. hey. I see you too. Hi, how are you? Very nice to see you. It's a pity you're not here, but virtually we know you're here with us. 
First and foremost, I should like to express my gratitude and appreciation to Maria Claudia Parias, Executive President of Batuta Foundation and Gracie Fuentes, Cultural Secretary of the Mayor's Office of Ibagué. Your work will surely make a difference in social transformations. Mark, we don't have much time, so I'm going to take advantage of um, having you with us. And obviously, I'm very honored and pleased to be able to talk with you. Your work is inspiring, and I really hope we find common places that may inspire cultural managers and artists and creators in Colombia. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It is my honor and pleasure to be here. As I was researching for this interview, out of many things you've written, danced, said, and I found this in your presentation as VP of the Kennedy Center in June of last year, you said, we're working to produce symbols that inspire while cultivating systems that sustain an equitable future. And I believe that's not only poetry, it's vitality. Let's talk about the importance of symbols inspiring youth. Mm. Um, there, there are so we create symbols out of um, out of many things. Obviously, the the symbol of George Floyd, um, the symbol of Black Lives Matter, um, the 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 symbol in a nefarious way of the last president of the United States, whose um, name I won't say. There there are symbols. Um, on many different sides that I think invoke passion and invoke energy. We are galvanized um, by symbols or under the umbrella um, of symbols. But in the arts in particular, we make these gestures um, through dance, through poetry, through music that catalyze a particular kind of energy um, I find my work is, is to take the power of those gestures um, and to take the dynamism of poetry and think about systemic roots. Because the other side of the quotation that you just um, named is, is I talk about um, racism and um, how in, in my country, how in the United States, there is a move since July, really June, July of 2020 for organizations and for corporations to aspire to be anti-racist. And what I say is that if racism is systemic, then anti-racism must be systemic as well. If racism is structural in the same way that patriarchy might be structural, then to be anti-racist also must be structural. So th the job is to take the power of symbol, the beauty of art, the inspiration of culture, and to, to re reverse this dynamic where we say, um, how can the arts heal us? I would rather say, how can our economy how can our economy function more like art making? How can healthcare um, live more in the modality of dance making? How can um, our system of governance be more like the manufacture of theater, um, collaborative and improvisational? how can we actually shift society more towards an artistic modality rather than messing society up and then just waiting for the arts to heal at the end? Well, that's a fantastic idea. Do you have an example of how that, of how that may happen? I mean, you're saying that um, you should reverse instead of trying to copy models that we've probably seen in commerce, in treasury, in agriculture. How would you propose to a Ministry of Agriculture or Commerce, look, this is what we've done in arts. We've done lots of things with symbols. We've taken um, the, how you, in, in DEI rights, how would you put that 
to uh, an ad policy making, for example? I, I think that generally speaking, culture precedes policy. That the will of people, that the will of artists um, incite within the public imagination the possibility to legislate accordingly. Um, uh, unfortunately, we tend from a policy perspective to um, kind of live in a paradigm of verticality and divisiveness, which, um, which doesn't take in the cultural precedent inside of the public imagination. Instead, um, we essentially, and, and again, I'm, I'm speaking um, from the perspective of someone who currently lives in the, in the United States, we, we tend to operate from a position of minority rule, that minority being um, the, the very affluent, the very powerful, the, the very rich, um, who are in the minority, whereas the public imagination, um, I think, is, um, is more commonplace and, and shared more broadly. Um, you mentioned agriculture, which I think is a great way to think um, or, or a great example because nature itself loves diversity. Um, the idea of an ecosystem, the idea of, um, of an ecology um, also has corollaries with culture. We don't want a, a kind of monocultural system. The same way that nature craves diversity, we might think in terms of a biocultural diversity. We might think in terms of um, a kind of um, um, diversity of not only um, agricultural um, production, but agricultural access. So um, we have in the United States what we call food deserts, where um, there might in more affluent areas, there might be um, incredible access to, um, to food, um, to produce, um, to healthy products. Um, in poor neighborhoods, um, there's less access to, um, to healthy produce. Our food systems are designed in such a way to privilege um, the wealthy in terms of um, in terms of food and health. So, if we thought about if we thought about um, not only um, the way diversity works in nature, but the way that cultural diversity um, works uh, across our screens, in our theaters, um, in our dance, how would we create more equitable access, um, not just to inspiration, but to food? I, I don't think that, um, you know, how would um, a policymaker working in agriculture not only work on behalf of the farmer or the agriculturalist, but the consumer um, in a way that was more equitable in terms of distribution and access? What's the relationship between the production of food and the purveyors of food? These are things that we think about in the arts that I don't know that we um, think about in terms of our food systems. I agree with you, Mark, and obviously um, that would be a way of making culture be in the same table with policymakers as an idea of sustainable culture. You talk about equity. It's not new in your career. Your work is centered, as I said before, in DEI rights, diversity, equity, and inclusion. These are the basis for cultural yes. rights. How do these make social transformation? So um, it's a really good question. We are um, at a particularly tenuous place environmentally and in um, a rising tide of authoritarianism um, all, over, um, all over the West and throughout the global South. Um, this action, this place that we're in as with so many um, um, negative or totalitarian, uh, totalitarian movements is predicated on fear um, and especially fear of the other, 
and fear of individuals outside of hegemonic center. Um, those of us that are female, those of us that are queer, those of us that are Black, those of us that um, uh, are non-Christian, folks that live outside of, um, of hegemonic center. But we are also at a place where human survival is going to be predicated on a, a kind of systematized empathy and compassion. Um, the only way that humans survive or humans will survive, particularly when it comes to environmental calamity and constraint um, in the environment is to develop more humane systems um, and um, systems that identify um, um, the other with a kind of dignity and um, th that think about dignity as a kind of currency to be equally shared. So my work um, is to locate within arts organizations um, the idea of dignity and belonging in cultural spaces um, as part of how we syst systemically program and market um, to think about artists as board members, to incentivize um, a relationship between the epistemologies of cultural workers on staff and youth of color, um, to think about art framed economies, to think about the political imagination, to root these things in our um, cultural organizations so we're not just thinking about a show um, or we're not just thinking about a, a kind of proportion, a demographic proportion of staff, um, but we're locating safety and dignity more prominently in how it is that we think about um, the development of, of systems. Um, when we talk about social transformation, the only way, like I said, that, that I think that we survive, that we transform um, our society um, is to think about all these tasks as future forward tasks. My um, colleague, Marina Gorbis, talks about futurity. And she says, we look at futurity in four different ways. Um, there's one way that is about growth, which is to say that we are at this point right here in time and we're going to continue forward almost in a linear way. There's another way to think about the future, which is through the lens of collapse, um, which is, the apocalypse is coming, it's all going to burn down and whatever future we have will be built out of the rubble of collapse. A, a third way of thinking about the future is through constraint. The idea that we have X amount of resources now and we will gradually have fewer and fewer, more diminished resources over time. But there's a fourth way of looking at the future which is through the lens of transformation. Artists, are the purveyors, are the conduits for a transformational future. Artists are futurists because artists can conceive of the world in um, ways that right now live just outside of the horizon, just outside of the radius of the public imagination. This is what I mean when I say culture precedes policy. The idea is first um, generally presented to us um, by, um, by artists, they incite the imagination. So um, this isn't just on the systemic level, when you talk about the relationship between art and transformation, artists literally paint a transformational future for everyone else to aspire to. It's very positive and I, I agree with the transformation and um, you've talked about dignity in cultural places and as I read about your job, the outcome of your work are both inspiring and hands-on on creative, and they're a promise of potential optimism and humor. And you've been optimistic, uh, saying that arts are transformation per se. That um, reminds me again of uh, cultural rights, but said in a very poetic way. Why do you believe arts, especially when we're talking of education in arts, may have a promise of humor and optimism? I think you've been there in just um, 
uh, answer you've said, but I, I'd like to think about the positive and the humoristic part of it. Um, and I've, that's what I've read about you. So okay. if you'd like to elaborate on that, please. Well, it, it, it is a, um, there, there is joy, isn't there, in life? Um, there for, for the level of intellect and ideas that are being shared at this conference and in our creative um, community, um, there's just as much laughter as anything else. And when I think of soulfulness, when I think about freedom truly, um, freedom is something that is carried in the body that generally is a response to good love or good food or good music. And so um, I, I think a lot about the idea of Black joy, that we have been um, uh, traumatized in the West that we have been traumatized over the last 500 years and that a lot of our narratives are um, positioned against that trauma. Um, but outside of the trauma, there is um, the creation and sustenance of um, joy and human interaction. And there are very few things that maybe we can um, agree upon maybe besides sports, you know, probably football and music are the only things that bring the world together. Yeah, I, I can't really think of anything else. You know, um, th there are people who I fervently disagree with politically, but we love the same music. As a matter of fact, working at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., you can imagine that there are all kinds of politicians that come through um, the theater. And I found myself in a room at one point with um, a Supreme Court justice with whom I agree upon nothing. Like, I detest this person's policies. But here we are enjoying the same um, piano, you know, the same pianist, the same soloist. And I, I you know, I, I wondered to myself at the time, how can this person possibly like music? And how can he possibly like the same music that I do? But he does. Um, because the other thing that I think um, the creative enterprise provides for us is humanity. Um, and when I spoke earlier of empathy and compassion and the systemic generation, a, a kind of infrastructure for inspiration, an infrastructure for joy, that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about art and cultural production. So yes, these are very serious issues, equity and diversity and access and inclusion. They're very serious issues, but at the heart of it, they are made possible because they emanate from a place of joy. I couldn't agree more, and that's probably what Fundación Batuta and the Secretary's uh, Office of Culture from the Mayor, Office of Ibagué, are doing with these infrastructure. They're an infrastructure for ideas and for joy, and that's why we're here today. Um, for all of us that work as cultural managers, artists, activists, creators, craftsmen, and women, uh, we strongly believe that culture is formed and can also transform itself. Do you agree? And why would that be so? I have to. At the root of your question is the idea of hope. And we, as critical as we might be, we are not in this business because we are not hopeful. In fact, we are in this business because we are hopeful. And are looking to weaponize love. We are looking to weaponize hope. And where does that thing come from? You, you know, where does that hope come from? For those of us that are parents, you know, a lot of times that hope, it comes from, um, from our children. For those of us that are in love, especially in the beginning parts of our love, a lot of times the inspiration comes from there. But, um, 
you know, when I'm, when I'm running and my legs are tired, I don't listen to my son's voice to motivate me. When, when I'm, um, when I have a deadline and um, I really just want to go to sleep, but I have to keep pushing as much as I love the woman in, in my life, I don't put a picture of her up and use that to motivate me. Um, I, I listen to music. I, I channel the words of Toni Morrison as some in the spirit of Harriet Tubman, whose activism itself um, is, is maybe the most prime example of courage and, um, um, and codified artistry of humanity and, um, and liberation struggle. We call upon artists, we call upon arts because I think we do envision something better for ourselves. And the antidote to all the weaponry, um, the capitalistic weaponry and the artillery that's available to um, propagandists of war, the, the, the battle really is not to fight fire with fire, I don't think. Um, the battle is actually for the imagination. What purveyors of war, what machinists of war seek to do is to stop the imagination. And what we do is incite it. We inflame it. Um, and in order to do that, we have to um, kind of gather ourselves around hope, around um, the promise of maybe something just a little bit better than what we were given. So um, I, you know, I love being here at this conference. I really do wish I was with you because it, sometimes you have to go to the church of the committed in order to reinforce for yourselves that um, you are not alone in your hope. Um, and maybe that would be um, the thing that moves me about being here with you and about the work that I do is I feel like I'm not alone in my hope. You're not and we're not. I'm sure Grace and Maria Claudia and Ministry of Culture agree. We are all together in this battle for hope. I'll go to more serious themes. Let's talk about financial support and public policies. What do you believe is the right or more secure way to guarantee support from local governments in turning their heads and saying, yes, I'm all in? We are giving financial aids. We are promoting arts programs in school programs and in after school education. Yes, we will support showcasing and circulation of arts. Um, the economic, the economic reality, our economic realities are not linear and they're not siloed. Um, our economic realities are not compartmentalized. We are, whether we like it or not, we exist in an interdependent um, way of, of finance, of living. And if nothing has taught us that more, it's the COVID-19 pandemic where my own safety is tied to the health-based decisions of my neighbor, of the people that I work with, of the people that I go to the market with. Um, we are inextricably tied together. So when I talk about um, a kind of arts practice or um, an equity and diversity inclusion practice that is tied to the future, um, you know, that is what I would lay at the feet of politicians who are making present financial decisions. What kind of future in terms of the realm of innovation do we actually want to construct? If if we think that it is important to build an infrastructure 
in service of a more sustainable environmental future. Um, what does the creative or intellectual environment look like? How do we actually foster innovation? Can we foster innovation um, by only thinking um, in terms of um, the marketplaces of science um, and mathematics or only in the marketplaces of um, web-based or app-based um, technology? I'm a 19 who's now um, at university. He'll be uh, 20 in December. And, and we were talking about greatness how um, in the United States, when I was growing up, there was an aspiration to be a great person. Now we more want to be known. We want to be rich, but we don't necessarily want to be great. So how do we aspire, inspire greatness? Um, what seeds are we sowing in the present day to create a template for greatness and innovation? If um, I, I work at the John F. Kennedy Center um, for the Performing Arts in Washington, DC, it's our National Cultural Center. Kennedy was the 35th president of the United States. He famously called upon the entire country to um, aim for the moon, to put a man on the moon, called it the moon shot. At the time, the math and the technology did not exist for us to get there, but he challenged us forward. Those same minds today would be used to create an app that would deliver food faster to you. We are, we are channeling our, our minds, and, and this just Catalina just gets to your question about education. We are currently channeling um, these minds towards a marketplace that's um, about the, the quick service of capitalist ends rather than the lofty service of human ideals. So if politicians or policymakers actually think about the future beyond the length of their political terms, then it, it, it's in our own best interest to also foster investment in creative practice, in imagination and innovation, and to develop the skills um, that it requires to um, collaborate towards the end of innovation. And there is no better place than that happens than in the arts. So there is one answer to your question, which is just, well, we need dance in our lives. We need music in our lives. We need theater in our lives. We need literature in our lives. And yes, policymakers should invest in our various disciplines, in, in the fine arts, et cetera. Politicians should invest in those disciplines because they literally make the world aesthetically beautiful. But just in service of innovation, and aspiration, the skills that are required to execute our um, artistic practices and creative practices at a high level actually move the human race forward as well. I have no idea who the monarchs of Europe were in the 16th and 17th century, but I know uh, Michelangelo and I know Beethoven, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know who was the monarch um, you know, in Austria during Mozart's time, but I know Mozart, right? It's the art that endures. It's the art that generates innovation. And um, if we're thinking about how we survive as a race moving into the 21st and 22nd centuries, then we have to invest in creative practice right now. You've been you've you've said how beautiful and how important arts is for the spirit and for social transformation, and absolutely agree with you. Music can inspire us, um, can inspire religious devotion, prepare individuals for war, motivate work, enrich play, mm -hmm. and stimulate passions. Musical healing mm -hmm. comes from the alabao sang by our cantaoras in the Colombian Pacific. I hope you've heard them. If you haven't, I really hope you do so. Pacific, modern rock, Will cumbia, do. hip hop all reveal music's power to transform lives. But why? What is it about music? 
<sighs> it's scientific almost. Because when you ask that question, the first thing I think about is vibration. And in my own spiritual practice, when I, when I think about what activates my spirit, it is the drum. When I think about what, um, where um, I have conversations with the divine, it's through um, my body responding as a tuning fork to um, the musical and melodic vibration that is, um, that is around it. When I think about heaven, I think about being in Brooklyn at two o'clock in the morning in a loft party, red lights and house music and sweat. I, I lose myself in the music. I use my body in order to leave my body. And that is a thing that only music and the, the conditions of music can, can create. So it is absolutely spiritual, it is absolutely soulful, but I also believe that there is a science of resonance and light. Um, there are frequencies just above or below the capacity of the ear that the heart still responds to. Um, and I, I, th I think in this way, um, we are more in tune to the rhythm of the ocean or um, the cycles of the planet. Um, we are um, connected um, through our hearts. If you go to a, um, to a concert, um, there inevitably is a moment at a music concert where because we're all responding to the same music and the music is, um, is at a particular pace, at a particular meter, all of our hearts are in sync. And that sounds a little, you know, mushy maybe. It, it might sound a little like new agey or, or whatever, you know, and please forgive me for saying that, but, but this is where your question leads me. There are, there are implications of the soul. There are implications of the spirit. There are scientific implications. Um, and then there's also just the, the space of wonder. Music bends the air and we bend with it. And what magic is that? Where else do we see that or experience that in our lives? How else? Um, it, even the silence has music to it. And sometimes that's what we do. We escape um, to nature or we escape to a place where we can just hear the music of nature. Um, and even that has healing properties. So, so I, I think that that's the, my response to your question is that um, music heals, but music ascends. Music Music is wings. They, music lifts us. It enables flight. Mark Bamuti Joseph, thank you very much. You've obviously been inspiring. You've talked about compassion, empathy, humane systems. You're profound. And someone which I hope to follow for a long time. Colombia is a country where our cultural values are still pending to be included in policy making in a much stronger way but it's also a country with such diversity, it would be an error not to hope that it's through diversity that we may reach inclusiveness, respect, and social development. Projects such as Fundación Batuta and what local governments with the support of the Ministry of Culture, such as Eva Guerre's mayor's office are doing, especially for music, that I believe we will be making social transformations. And as you said, weaponize love, weaponize hope. To all our guests and virtual friends, thank you for joining us for Believing. Thank you to the sponsors, organizers, and leaders of the second international seminar on music and social transformation. Mark, thank you very much. What an honor. I can't wait to meet you in person.
So we go on with the second seminar of music and social transformation. We just had a wonderful interview with Mark. We want to greet all musicians and artists in the International Day of Music, which is a perfect context to have this second international seminar on music and social transformation, an event organized on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of Batuta, together with the mayor's office of UAG. Let's remind all people from UAG that the mayor's office have submitted the candidacy of UAG as a city of music. You can follow our programming on www.simts.co and our social networks at Fundación Batuta and arroba el caldiavague. Now we'll have a conversation that we have called Music From Here, Music From There, Exercises in Resistance between Professor Ma Martin Savelli and writer Stuart Bailey. Savelli is a PhD in literature from the University of Buenos Aires and a professor of literature. He is specialized in journalism. <coughs> he wrote a number of essays. He published the novel Estamos Esperados, which recreates the rock scene of post detectorship in Buenos Aires and the volume of Chronicles, God of the Underground. He's part of the board of directors of the historical archive of Argentine magazine, magazines that specializes in the city of magazines circuits to rock music. Professor Bailey lives in Belfast, Northern Ireland. He authored books such as Trouble Songs, Music in Conflict, Northern Ireland, and 75 Van Songs into the Van Morrison Songbook, published in 2020. He has experience in the media, 35 years experience in television and radio. He co-founded the OEA Music Center and this organization is a very important resource for musicians, entrepreneurs and dissemination of music values within territories. Specifically in this country, he is editor of the magazine Dick With It. Today, this conversation will be moderated by Juan Carlos Garay, also a journalist, writer, and translator. He has authored three novels, La Nostalgia del Melómano, La Canción de la Luna, and La Balsa de Fuego. And he co-authored, along with other three researchers, of the book Jazz in Bogota that we did with Philharmonic Orchestra of Bogota in 2010. Juan Carlos, welcome. Let's talk about rock music and its importance in social construction of territories. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Maria Claudia. Thank you, Grace. Thank you to all the people that are watching us on the internet. This discussion will go around rock music. And I would like to begin with an example, not necessarily from rock. We will broaden this space a little more to discuss other musics that have served as soundtracks of social resistance. I have always liked how Portugal went from that ultra right regime that was called Estado Novo into something more sex flexible and more liberal in a revolutionary way, but a non violent way. There's a beautiful story about this episode in Portugal. It's related to exhaustion, the exhaustion of a regime. There was anti liberal, there was colonialistic Portugal did have a number of colonies in the African continent, and that exhaustion of the people and the military even 
led to one day in April in 1974, for something that was called the Carnation Revolution. And the Carnation Revolution was this. From a point of view, from a visual point of view, people started displaying and placing carnations in the barrels of the weapons of the army and the radio stations one morning started to broadcast one song that was called Grand de la Villa Moran and it was prohibited by the regime and when people started listening to this song on the radio without violence what came about was deep change deep change in mentality because the radio was playing one song and then that song stopped being prohibited just because we changed the way we think and we decided we never wanted to go back to the past and so in this way i believe that a reflection that is very important how music can be the soundtrack of resistance or a social change of transformation the cases that we will uh, look at today are the cases in argentina with martin savelli and in northern ireland with stuart billy of course we will add a little bit of the experience of the last few months in Colombia, of course, with a series of social demonstrations and everything that has happened around this, from music, of course. Let us listen initially to Martin Savelli. Martin, welcome. From Carlos, thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you to Fundación Matito. This is a real pleasure. Stuart, Juan Carlos, greetings. They asked me to talk about the sense of rock in Argentina, its relationship with the story of a country, in particular during the years of the dictatorship, which is central for the historical development of the rock culture around 1965. of rock in the Spanish language for 20 years. There were a number of military regimes. In 66, there is a coup in Argentina, and another one in 60, 76 until 1983. So a, a great portion of this initial development of rock in Argentina has been branded by censorship, repression, dictatorship. The interpreter apologizes. Sound quality is low. So rock is initially coming from the Anglo-Saxon culture from Europe, and this makes you think about the ways in which we appropriate that culture that is produced by European or North American centers that are never passive appropriations or that imply the annihilation of culture. But on the other hand, there's this American uh, critic, Richard Moores, and he created the concept of cultural sands, cities in the periphery that can metamorphose these ideas that come from metropolitan centers, such as the case of rock culture. Rock begins in Argentina in the mid 50s through some films, some classical films, but uh, the interpreter apologizes, sound quality is very low. And the first groups are just copies of Anglo Saxon bands without their own contact. Then in the mid 60s, a new own creative style starts appearing within that commercial circuit of rock music. At the time, we didn't even call it rock. In Argentina, we called it beat music or progressive music. After that, we started 
talking about national rock, which is almost an oxymoron, because rock is not born in our nation, so national rock is an oxymoron, but it's a phenomenon of transculturation that local reception of the interpreter apologizes, sound quality is very low. They start composing their own pieces, but rock singers in Argentina, Argentina was one of the first countries that started producing a music scene with groups that developed their own lyrics in Spanish, not translated lyrics from American songs, but specifically their own productions. And so they start creating this first avant-garde, this bohemian rock and activity that was marginal in the beginning. For me, particularly as a researcher in rock music, I don't want to talk about particular groups or particular songs. I'm interested about the space, the influence between rock culture and the city how the public and rock musicians occupy material and symbolic spaces, how they circulate around urban spaces, how the city affects the production and the consumption of music. I think this is essential to give the spatial dimension of human life an interpretive power to understand historical and social processes, even economic processes. We are beings that are intrinsically special, that are committed to creating places that we inhabit territories. And so this is why I believe that this this was the big this is the beginning of that relationship with space, with performance of being the relationship the human subject faces when inhabiting a space. And so in this first years of national rock, there was a term that the first musicians called to being stranded. They were just left to drift in the city and they used the main squares of the city as spaces to just sit down and sing and compose and socialize. These first spaces, they had nothing to do with these alternative circuits that appeared later. They would go two or three days without sleep because they thought that Staying awake stimulated creativity. Of course, they were consuming amphetamines, but the term to be stranded is quite original to discuss about this drifting. The interpreter apologizes, sound quality is very low. They broke that temporal dimension that's imposed by the city, but of course these uses of the spaces were stopped by the military and the dictatorship and censorship. Uh, military regimes wanted to stop all change of the Argentine society from the 60s, modernization The interpreter apologizes, sound quality is very low. I said there was persecution. The state wanted to repress the excuse of morality. They detained women. They stopped women from wearing short skirts or trousers. They prosecuted homosexuals leftist political ideas and young people that had long hair dressed flamboyantly. They were the victims of this military regime. <clears throat> so Argentine rock had this authoritarian component, which was fundamental for our rock music, the movement against that authority. And we had then later 30 mil, 30,000 audience members in larger spaces, in public spaces, uh, sta stadiums, 
for example, Luna Park, which is a stadium in the center in the downtown area of Buenos Aires. It's kind of like a temple to rock, you could say. But we started to see more um, instances of violence. For example, issues with police. We had a very, very tense socio-political situation in Argentina in 69. We had a popular uprising, which especially involved workers and students in the city of Córdoba. This event was known as the Cordobazo. We had another issue in 68, and many Argentine youth opted for political militants. And they decided to arm themselves. So within this very tense political context, we started to see face-offs with the police at these rock events. And so the rock audience The interpreter apologizes, there is a great deal of audio interference. And rock started to be seen as a foreignizing influence and like a formation of the petite bourgeois, if you would like to say that. And so leftist protesters would say, we are Peron. We are Peron's soldiers. And there was another militant group that many youths joined. And so we are not faloperos. They wanted to say that they were against homosexuality and drug taking. And this was clearly directed at the rock audience, at rock fans. And so it was not it was not seen as a positive thing to follow rock. It was seen as a political issue. So within this very tense environment, this dictatorship, this violence, rock became like a refuge, a space for consolidation for youth culture at a time when young people were in fact killing. And from 1976, Onwards, the state became a terrorist state. We saw a regime of terror. And the interpreter apologizes. There was a disappearance of thousands of people. And so there's a whole generation here that was greatly impacted by this military government. Any kind of public meeting was considered dangerous. And so Rock became a place of refuge. So it's like a life raft for young people. And it also was a way for them to fight back against paranoia and violence. For the logic of the dictatorship, there was a connection between subversion and rock. So subversives were anyone who did not share the same Western ideas when it came to um, family, etc. And we started to see attacks on the rock culture, especially through what is called racias. If you wanted to go to a rock show, there were buses that would pick people up. But a lot of the time, these buses would actually detain people. But of course, um, there was, there were other, these were legal imprisonments of rock fans, but there were a lot of illegal imprisonments as well. And uh, we saw a great deal of corporal punishment involved as well. But for um, Rock fans, a lot of the time, would be imprisoned for a couple of days. The authorities would cut their hair and then send them home. And there were also 57 clandestine spots to detain people in Buenos Aires. 
and oftentimes people would be tortured and later killed. So, rock becomes a, a place of refuge. Can we please go to the next image? In August of 76, And this brought along an alternative link to, to rock. Energies, alternatives, um, Eastern cultures, underground artistic expressions, all of this was linked to rock music. And this is a Im very, very impressive communicative manifestation. And young people amongst this whole climate of, of paranoia found a place for mutual recognition. And there was a lot of paranoia, a lot of uncertainty, and people were afraid to even meet with their friends on the street. So rock served the function of giving places to meet and forming a refuge for young people. Here in this image, you can see uh, this search for people who think differently, friends, mutual recognition. The idea is to construct social networks that the military dictatorship had broken down. We also had the guerra de las Malvinas of the Falklands and this was very important when it came to development of rock culture and we saw the radio diffusion of music in English A lot of tango and folk music was played in the 70s on the radio, but national rock was not played on the radio. So, for the first time, we started to hear Argentine rock played at a mass level on the radio. And we started to see new publics or new audiences interested in rock. And nonetheless, the dictatorship had already associated rock with suspicious activities such as drug taking. But when it came to the Falklands, we had young soldiers at the age of 18 going to fight. And there was this continuous idea that rock was something to be suspicious of. A solidarity festival was held. American Solidarity, you can see an image here <coughs> for this recital that brought together a great number of people. 60,000 rock fans attended the festival. This was actually organized with the military government. Some groups decided not to play at the festival because they did not want to work with these public servants. Towards the end of the dictatorship, uh, please tell me when it's time to wrap. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going over time, Juan Carlos. We start to see new tendencies and currents arrive. For example, new wave punk rock that also started to have an impact in the city of Buenos Aires and create another universe of listeners. We also see an underground culture called the underground movement. <laughs> in the city of Buenos Aires. And it's like a 180 compared to the previous development of rock that we had seen, for example, national rock, as I said earlier. And this underground culture, which was towards the end of the decade of the military dictatorship, we see some new forms and strategies that were implemented to break down this confinement and to break down this regime of terror. So the strategy was one of joy. 
the idea was to recover or take back power of joy of, of people's bodies. We saw also recitals and visual artists coming together, new forms of social interaction to fight back against the repression and fear that had taken over in previous years. Okay, just one more minute, please. Okay, let me close. So, at the end of the second dictatorship, we see the resurgence or the creation of the underground movement. And so we have artistic presentations, music, visual arts, and different disciplines, which combined a kind of breaking free when leaving this dictatorship, just like we saw La Movia Madrileña at the end of the Franco regime. And so we see the solidarity recital uh, in favor of rock, in favor of peace. And here we have an image from that time. This was over, uh, pasted up on <laughs> every wall in Buenos Aires. Okay, Juan Carlos, I don't want to take any more of your time. I know that during the Q&A session, we can continue to talk, but that's essentially what I wanted to share with you today. Thank you very much for the time. Yes, of course, we will continue the conversation. That would be great. But let me now hand over to Stuart Bailey. He has a video he would like to share with us. And after the video, we will hear his presentation he will tell us about his research. It's the same case, but in Northern Ireland. Let's please watch the video. Trouble Songs is a book about music and conflict in Northern Ireland. The story is told by Bono, Christy Moore, The Undertones, Step Little Fingers, Orbital, Terry Hooley, The Rubber Bandits, and the Miami show band Survivors. The soundtrack is John Lennon, Paul McCartney, The Pogues, The Clash, The Cranberries and Elvis Costello. Trouble Songs is a different hearing of the conflict and proof of music's value as a persuader, agitator and peacemaker. Okay, thank you for this video which tells us about your book. Your book, Stuart, that is about music and conflict in Northern Ireland. Bienvenido, Stuart. <clears throat> Could you please switch on your microphone, Stuart? Can you open your microphone? I think you can hear me now. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Great. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, do you want me to speak now a little bit about where I've where I've come from or my story? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, we would like to know about uh, your um, your research, your book. Okay. Well, uh, I was born in 1961, and the conflict in Northern Ireland started in 1968. So I, I can't really remember a period before the conflict in Northern Ireland. I was very young, but I grew up during uh, a, a period of political turmoil. Uh, there was a 30-year conflict in Northern Ireland, uh, essentially between the people who thought they were British nationality and the people who wanted to be part of an Irish Republic. Uh, 3,500 people died during that conflict. Uh, it was a very militarized world. The British army were on the streets. There were car bombs, there were explosions, there were assassinations. And it was a very, very difficult time. The city centre was, was locked off. There was a route, what they called it, the Ring of Steel. So at night, the whole city centre was shut down. Um, I went to school in a city centre and we, we had um, tape on the windows for explosions. We, we had bomb drills and, uh, on the front of the, the school to, to prepare for, 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 for bad experiences. And it was a very, um, it was a mixture of fear and anxiety and also boredom because very little was happening beyond the conflict. And uh, I, I became a music fan like a lot of teenagers. 
1975, there was a terrible uh, murder and assassination of, of a of band of entertainers. They were called the Miami Show Band, and they were killed possibly by British collusion. So they were they were they were shot. Three members of the band were shot at the side of a road after a after a gig, and um, consequently, then music almost stopped. In 1977, punk rock was very active in the UK. And in 19, uh, around that time, some of the bands started to appear. Bands like The Clash came to Northern Ireland and, and you saw a few photographs in that little film clip earlier and they had their photographs taken by the British Army. And But it was an interesting time because punk was about questioning, about questioning where you live, questioning your beliefs. Uh, it was about um, not trusting the establishment and the hierarchy and the media. And for me, that was a very exciting time because all of a sudden you started to think about all of these, you know, Northern Ireland was a very sectarian place. So Protestants and Catholics were, were educated in different schools. They lived in different parts of the, the cities. So you were kind of kept uh, away from these people who were essentially the same as you. Um, so punk rock all of a sudden became very revolutionary and everyone started to go to the punk gigs in the center of time. And that was very exciting because you were meeting people from the other side of town. And it didn't really matter if you were a Protestant or a Catholic. It mattered more if you liked the Clash or the Sex Pistols. So, so that, that changed my perception. And some people argue that it changed the whole way that Northern Ireland kind of, that the future of Northern Ireland um, grew out of that, that period. Uh, we lived through some really terrible times, the hunger strikes of 1981. There were 10 political prisoners who, 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 who killed themselves or died through going on hunger strike. And, and, and that was a very painful period. And there was a lot of very intense music from the folk tradition, especially, but also from the rock tradition about what was going on and about British policy and about the Republican ideals. And through the 80s, it started to feel almost hopeless. We also had a lot of songs by people like U2, The Police, Simple Minds, Stadium Rock wanted to write about Northern Ireland just as it wanted to write about Latin America and all of these other things. We became a cause and a, a conscience. And later then we went into what you call the peace process. So very slowly there started to become negotiations, a calming down of certain uh, political stances. We had a peace process that, that Bill Clinton and various other politicians ascribed to. And in 1998, then we had a referendum on, on the Good Friday Agreement, which was a political agreement between some of the main political parties. And the negotiations were going very badly. And there was a gig put on, uh, three days notice, and it featured U2 and some local musicians and for the first time ever, the two main politicians from the two traditions came on stage, Trimble and Hume, and they shook hands. And, and it was very similar to a moment when Bob Marley got the two Jamaican politicians, Siaga and Manley, to shake hands. And that event raised the vote, the yes vote, in favour of the referendum by at least 2%. And uh, at very short notice, with three days before the elections or the referendum, uh, music changed the political landscape of Northern Ireland. I was the compere, I was the MC of that concert. So it was very exciting to be in the middle of this moment. And uh, so for me, uh, my point of view would be that music can crystallize an idea, music can encourage debate, music can mobilize young people, music can change minds and perceptions. So I, I have a lot of love for music and a lot of faith in music. And in Northern Ireland now, we're in a very different landscape. We don't have uh, overt violence, but what we do have is a lot of suicides, a lot of youth suicide. There's a feeling of hopelessness in, in post ceasefire. 
because there isn't a future, there isn't a direction. People talk about the dividend of peace, but the dividend of peace is that property developers are getting very rich. The center is becoming very uh, gentrified. There's a lot of big buildings going up, but in the um, the, 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 the housing areas on, on, on the outside of the city, the working class people have got a, a worse time than before. So um, it's a very difficult time at the minute. And I think music is, is still articulating that. Music is um, shouting about gentrification. Music is shouting about um, marriage equality, about LGBT, about a lot of the, the civil rights issues that haven't been realized yet. So we're still in a very exciting place in terms of creative resistance and creative opposition to uh, certain things. Uh, before it, it might've been the British colonial policy or it might've been paramilitary violence. And now it's about capitalism, I think. So there's still a, a very active debate in music in Northern Ireland. Thank you very much, Stuart. So, in the time that we have remaining, let's receive some questions. I would ask that you please uh, keep your answers brief. Don't be superficial, of course, but brief. Claro que sí. Viviana, would you like me to translate this question? Okay, fantastic. I have a memory of an interview that was that Elvis Presley gave, and he was asked about the Vietnam War. Elvis Presley was once interviewed, and uh, they asked him about the Vietnam War. And he said, I cannot comment on that because I am an entertainer. And he said, I cannot comment because I'm an entertainer. And so this leads to the first question. Was Elvis right? Can a performer comment on politics or should music always political? I would like to start with Martin. When can music be political or apolitical? Thank you very much for this question. It's very interesting. I think this is not only about music, but about any artistic manifestation. I don't think that music has to be at the service of politics, although the act itself is political in essence because of the changes that it generates, the possibilities it opens up, uh, and also the way that it gives youths the possibility to express themselves. And so I think the idea is that young people are producing, young people produce the art in the form of music. Julio Cortázar, the Argentine writer in the 60s, said that his literature was not at the service of the leftist revolution. And he said, literature does not need to serve the revolution. The idea is to have a revolution in literature itself, change the form of art, change artistic forms, but not put art at the service of a revolution or politics. And I think that rock is a genre that has a clear political brand or mark, but there are some young people who have started off not even knowing how to play an instrument, who end up teaching themselves and forming a band and making art, and that is at the service of all society, in my opinion. Okay, um, Stuart, what do you have to say? Well, I, I feel like I am a product of, of political music. I feel like it has, has created me. It's created my personality. It, is, it has given me um, kind of um, uh, shapes to my life, a, a way of living my life. Um, so, uh, but there's nothing worse than a bad political song. A bad political song is counterproductive. 
So uh, there, there was a terrible thing happened in 1972 in Northern Ireland when, when the British Army shot 14 people. They called it Bloody Sunday. And there was lots of musical reactions to that. Uh, Paul McCartney uh, released a song called Give Ireland Back to the Irish. And uh, it wasn't a great song. <laughs> uh, you know, he made a point and... Uh, and John Lennon then released a song called Sunday Bloody Sunday. And uh, the John Lennon song, especially, just a, a, not a good song. You know, you know the, the lyrics were poor. The, the content was almost racist, where he was saying, these people need to be burnt. You know, the, the, the British, the British Irish, where, you know, should be incinerated. So, so I, 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 I don't feel that every political song is worthwhile, but I think a good political song at the right time, at the right place, is very powerful. We have a folk singer here called Christy Moore, and if you listen to the songs that Christy Moore made during the hunger strike of 1981, they're very, very powerful and very alive, and almost like a diary of what was going on day by day. And in terms of punk, uh, one of the great bands from Belfast, they were called Stiff Little Fingers. And they had a song called Alternative Ulster. And the song was basically a manifesto for young people for to have a new society that didn't have sectarianism. And it changed my life in a lot of ways. You know, every line in the song almost is a, a challenge to think outside the box, to think freshly about your own context and your own experience so i you know political music for me is incredible and it always changes and um especially in a place where there's so much wrong uh, and and where our political leadership is so bad to have young people with guitars proposing different solutions is a very exciting thing I'd like to talk about another topic, which is censorship, <laughs> which is very closely linked to what we've been talking about. In some cases, we've seen songs that have been banned. No, there have been songs that have been prohibited. Um, there have been censorship. So I would like to ask you, and uh, maybe we can start with Stuart this time. In your research, what have you found specifically about censorship um, in music? Okay. Well, cases of music censorship. Uh, as, a, as an example, the Paul McCartney song, Give Ireland Back to the Irish, was, was censored uh, on British, British radio. You couldn't play it. Um, so Paul McCartney tried to put advertisements in the, in the music press to say we have been banned. So he tried to make a, a kind of a virtue out of it to say, well, I'm a revolutionary. They won't play my music on the radio. In Ireland, Paul McCartney gave Ireland back to the Irish was number one in the, in the music charts. So it was hugely popular in Ireland. And uh, just prior to that, there was a, a, an issue called internment where the British Army put hundreds of people in camps without any court. And they, they, they just said they were suspicious. They, they might be terrorists. And there was a song by local musicians and it was called The Men Behind the Wire. And it was a song about internment, about people who had been lifted. And it was banned on all of the Irish radio stations and it still got to number one in the Irish charts because the people, the public, wanted to buy it. And uh, censorship was almost counterproductive. It, it kind of created an intrigue. It made people interested in it. There's a long, long history of censorship in, 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 in the arts in Ireland and British rulers for a long time stopped Irish people singing about nationality and identity. And what they did was they, they wrote in code. So they created a, a personality called Dark Rosaline. And it was about a lost woman, a vision, a ghost, an Ashleen. And uh, Dark Rosaline, the Ashleen, the ghost, became a symbol of Ireland uh, in, 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 through history. So, so the Irish people could never be stopped from writing about politics. They just wrote about it in code for a long time. So 
it made it more powerful and more strong. So uh, I don't think you can ever stop protest. People just find different ways to articulate it. And everyone who's in that community knows what's being said. And that's what makes it kind of very intriguing. And that, that's, that was reflected in my book. Martin, cases of censorship apply to music? Well, as you can imagine, thousands. During the dictatorship, there were blacklists of artists that included rock musicians, but also representative artists of our country like Mercedes Sosa. There were censored folkloric groups, specific artists, groups many artists had to go into exile. The situation was a lot graver than just censoring a song. You had to leave the country to keep alive. However, with respect to censorship, you ask specifically, some strategies were instrumented that were very interesting. One of those was creating through humor and parody. There was a group in the beginning of the 80s that were called The Twists in Buenos Aires, and they had a song that was called I Thought It Was About the Blind People because a number of men wearing sunglasses come to look for them. And it's ironic because back then there were the services, what were called the services. There were civilians that acted for the police. The para-police. And so the song said, I thought it was the blind man. It's a, a humoristic take on, on, on this seizure by para-police. And so, yes, it became a, a logic of parody. They were called intelligence services. They had a, a, a green falcon wearing suits and dark and, and, and sunglasses. So, yes, this was a parody to escape this. On the other hand, there was a whole metaphorical system. Artists like Charlie Garcia, who's turning 70 and the whole city celebrating. He's a very important artist for national rock they started using certain metaphors to avoid censorship. He has a song that's called The Dinosaurs. And the song says, our friends can disappear, those at the square can disappear, those in the neighborhood can disappear, but dinosaurs will disappear, says Charlie. And everyone knew that dinosaurs were the military. The dinosaurs were all these people's mentality took us to the past and conservatism and obstructed the future. So I would mention those two strategies to avoid censorship, parody and humor. On the other hand, a discourse, a discourse that is oblique and metaphorical. It's difficult to escape censorship because if you see why these songs were being censored, it's not logical. You can think, hey, why? Yeah, they, they, they can name a, a drug in particular, or criticize a character. No, it's just a kiss at the cinema was censored. There is no logic to escape censorship. Well, my friends, it seems our time is almost up. I would just like to ask one very quick question. Very quick question and very quick answer. And so this, with this, we wrap up, and this would be a serious, hard conclusion. Can music change the world? Can music change the world? Can music change society? Um, Stuart? The answer is yes. I, I think music can help. And uh, I, I always think of the song, We Shall Overcome. And it's a song that came out of the, the church, it started as I will overcome or I shall overcome. It became we shall overcome. And it took people on marches in the American South to Selma. And it took people in Northern Ireland on civil rights marches. And people sang it together. And it was designed and it evolved as a song to carry people forward. When I hear that song and when I see archive of that in Northern Ireland in the 60s, it makes me very emotional. So I, I think music is is not the only solution to, to the world, but I think when music interacts with politics and with society at the right time in the right place, 
it really makes a difference. Martin, can music change society? Yes, definitely. I don't know if it can change society, but it certainly can change individuals, and that is the first step to generate change in society, to change ideas and conceptions on life, on politics within all of us. In my particular case, punk, hardcore, and all these genres are very important because they sent a message against the establishment and they changed my way and my ideas 30 years after I still commune with these ideas that I took from music. So, yes, it even changed my vote in elections. So, yeah, definitely it is a way to change society because if my vision of politics, if my vision of the system of the establishment is related to my musical influences. Martin Savelli from Argentina. Mr. Bailey from Northern Ireland, thank you very much indeed. Well, Claudia, after f listening to this very interesting conversation, we have two very powerful words. Number one, music is hope and it brings hope. And the other one is that art promotes innovation, definitely. Today is our last day and second seminar on music and social transformation that we have created together with Fundación Nacional Batuta. How do you feel, Maria Claudia, in our last day? I'm very happy and I have a little bit of nostalgia. I'm happy because we have shared lots of knowledge. We have got to know on inspiring experiences. We have understood different logics of how to understand the value of music and its relationship with education, new trends in education. Music at borders, sense of identity, confinement, pandemic. What's happened? What's happening? New technologies, communications. So today we're discussing this. Music and politics. How Music goes beyond the senses and identities, the voice of the youths and the ways how new aesthetics and ethics keep a deep relationship with music thinking and doing. It's just beautiful. Let's greet all our friends online who are watching us on www.simts.co and of course our public in the auditorium of the University of Tolima for the Secretary of Culture of UAG within the candidacy of UAG as a UNESCO City of Music and celebrating Batuta's 30th anniversary. It is a very great honor to have this encounter that today focuses on world reflection on the ideas and the importance of music in today's world. Now we will have the panel musicians and social mobilization, the voice protest. It includes Vivea Quintana, Johan Sullivan and Analyzer, Adriana Lescano and Linaje Originarios. This will be moderated by Juan Camilo Mina Giraldo, musician, saxophonist, composer and culture manager of the city of IOAG. He has come lady degrees in saxophone. He studied in Florida, Austria and he is currently a workshop facilitator in the Conservatory of Tolima, Auxiliary Director of the Symphonic of Tolima, and Music Representative in the Culture Council of the City. Before we continue with Juan Carlos, at the end of this panel, we will have our last music ritual with Ronald Balanta from Cauca, Colombia, a zone that includes mestizo, ancestral, religious, and pagan convergences. It's a charity in which indigenous and black music is used with salsa, technicumbia, chirimia, the Cauca Valen made from Gawa, and Arroyos Belanta will perform Chambimbe. We hand over to you, Juan Carlos. Thank you, Grace. 
Good morning and welcome to our music city, Iwage. Today it's a wonderful day, it's a beautiful day. For the people that aren't here in person, all these days we've had lots of rain and it's been cold, but today, our last day, it's wonderful and sunny and crisp, sending our best energy and this wonderful heat and this wonderful warmth of the people in our music city. I want to thank all the people that have watched our uh, discussions. And it's important to highlight the role of Batuta and the head of Medical Paredes, the Secretary of Culture and the head of Grace Fuentes. Thank you. Thank you very much for creating these scenarios, these events, for creating this space where we can all converge and come together and discuss what we love and what we're passionate about, social transformation. I'd like to seize the opportunity also to thank our panelists that will join us shortly. And this last day, I want to thank all the technical staff that have made all this broadcast possible, people of sound, lighting. This has been excellent. We've had a number of difficulties, but here we are. Thank you. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the academic committee. We have many of the members of the academic uh, committee, Juan, Claudia, Tony, all these people that donated their time and effort to make this event a reality, to share these wonderful experiences with all these people that have shared so many beautiful things. Our panelists are now here. I also want to thank you, our online audience. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you to listen to us throughout all these days. As in my case, I hope that we all learned a lot and that we can take away this message of hope, transformation, and that music can lead us to wonderful things. That reminds me of something that my grandmother said. She said that a day that you did not laugh or learn something new was a lost day. So I hope that our friends online have taken advantage of all these discussions. So let's get into the discussion. We are welcoming our panelists. We are waiting for you, Koi Koi. But let's begin. We have four panelists that are also joined by this thread, social transformation, specifically in social mobilizations. This panel is called Voices of Protest. Before we begin, I would like to share a little bit with you and with our friends online. A little bit about the dynamic for this panel. So number one, we have very uh, short time. These topics are so interesting that we could go on for many hours, but we just have 40 minutes. So let me introduce you one by one so that the public can get to know you, know about your work. And then I will uh, have some individual questions so that we can build a collective construction, a conversation towards a specific point. Uh, we hope to deal with topics like identity, counterculture, culture, self-esteem, social and cultural programming, and that relationship of power, which is an aspect that generates these social mobilizations to our panelists. I would like our audience to get to know you, not just as artists, but also as individuals, people. We go to the supermarket. You have to queue at the bank. You have had access to education, to health services. You're just regular people, independently of your function within society. We're all individuals. And so from there, we will have a conversation. So please feel free to ask and give us your comments. And we will find similarities, or maybe not, through your experiences within social and cultural contexts. 
And this is the end of my intervention. Now let's find a series of actions and identify actions because the debate has been going on for a long time. And I think it's important to be grounded and reach conclusions. We want to listen to what you have done throughout these months of unrest and mobilization so that the people that are watching musicians, the people that have the possibility for their voice to be heard, decision makers, not just public but private sectors, so that they can take those actions into account. So let's share and welcome. Before going on, we're waiting for Okoi Koi. I want to talk a little bit and let me read about the context of our country in the last few months. The last few years, Colombia has moved towards social mobilizations. A large proportion of the population have demanded from national authorities to guarantee access to basic rights the right to land, to health, to life, right to education, to dignified employment, a number of just requests that are enshrined in our constitution. Now, the government on multiple occasions has had a belligerent response since the 28th of April, almost without interruption, until the first weeks of August, Colombia underwent a series of protests and blockages that generated the death of three policemen, 75 assassinations, 44 presumptively by the armed forces, and NGOs uh, differ in the total number of deaths, 83 victims of injuries to their eyes, 28 victims of sexual violence, 1,468 physical violence victims, one sentence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights against the government, and in general a polarized environment and an environment of distrust against the state, and a collective discovery of the need to reinvent ourselves as a society. That need is what brings us together today, that need to reinvent ourselves, to transform through music. After this context, I want to welcome, of course, one by one, Vivir, Viviana Monserrat Quintana. How are you, Viviana? Hi, I'm doing great. What about you? I'm very happy very happy to be in the seminar and I do thank this space. We must share what we're doing, not just as musicians, as you were saying, but also as individuals who seek transformation of our context. I am in Mexico. And we're going through a very difficult situation. It's violent, especially violence against women. And what I do is that I serve life and society through song and music, which is what I know. The fight and the struggle and activism is for all of us. We can all be leaders because you can change your environment. I'm very worried about gender-based violence, so I worked. I work against this, so I put my throat, my guitar, and my soul in the service of this. And so thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Viviana. For those who don't know Vivir, I do invite you to watch her on YouTube and visit her networks. I don't like labels to define what people are or what they do, but in this exercise where we have a very short time, it's important that our friends online can get to know you a little bit better. What I have seen from your work and your interviews, and I have realized what an exceptional woman you are through the number of experiences of your life, 
that have taken you to this point. She comes from a region of Mexico that is rural from a small village, Francisco Madero. Yes, indeed, to the north of Mexico. It's a very small village. But yes, I was one of those girls that went to school on rural paths. Now it's all paved. My town has grown a bit. And people uh, don't like our sit uh, town to be called a town. They like think that it's a city. So yes, I took these paths in Coahuila, Francisco Madero. It's a desert and it's very hot and it's very dry. Sometimes the temperature is 48 centigrade. And we had sandstorms. So yes, all of these factors have informed my music, having that connection and that experience. Very close to nature, very close to the earth. I think it's important that we pay attention to our natural resources. And we need to focus on trying to improve the situation, how we can love our peers through music and through knowledge of ourselves. What a beautiful message. For the people that don't know Vivienne, she is the daughter of two school teachers. In fact, you're a Spanish teacher by training, aren't you? Yes, indeed, I'm a school teacher. And that did give me a very broad, not an advantage, but a, a, a love for words and for doing things for my society, for the people around me. And so to create these big waves. Since I was very little, I saw my parents being rural teachers and going to these smaller communities to look for students that had dropped out. And they said, no, 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 I'm not coming back to school because I can't pay for the trip there. I don't have money for the lorry that will take me there or for the breakfast. And in my house with my parents, I saw a number of students that my parents said, okay, they talked to their parents and said, okay, if your child doesn't have the opportunity to study because they don't have breakfast or because they don't have fa uh, money for the lorry, uh, so let them come to our house and uh, so they can be close to the school. And so we received in our home many students in our house with my parents. So my parents did so that seed to look for the way for everyone to get the same opportunities. Because in the end, that is transformation of our country. That is the answer to transform families and neighborhoods and cities and the country at large. Yes, you're very right. Vivier crossed the borders. A couple of days we were talking about borders and physical limits and symbolic limits. And you cross the border with your song, Sin Miel, Without Fear, which became a feminist anthem for women all around the world. But let me ask you something, which is the same question for all the members of our panel, so that we can create this common ground. You have already partly responded uh, to this, but what circumstances and what experiences in life led you to discover that inner voice that you have? That voice that says, I am Vivier Quintana. I sing the way I do. I write what I write to make this personal life decision that took you to take that personal and musical part that brings you today to this seminar. Well, when I left my home to go study music, I left my parents' house at 17 from that community in Madero. I left the community at 17. 
and I went to live to a city that is the capital of the state of Coahuila, that's called Saltillo. And so I went there to a student home. So when I left home and I left my parents, I left this privileged life in a certain way, not in the economic sense, but yes, in the emotional way, because my parents were always two teachers that tried that all three children saw life from a different perspective, and we saw poetry and words and science and arts that we regarded these from love and from a point where we knew that they can save us from any circumstance. So I left my house, and I realized that reality, the real world, was different. My friends, my uh, colleagues, their conditions was, were, uh, were different. I found injustice due to my condition as a woman. So I faced work, social injustice. Then I start working, and I realized that there was this different kind of privilege where you went to uh, give classes in the rural communities. And so when I was studying, one of my colleagues was the victim of an assassination because she was a woman. And the press treated this as just a, a, a student love pact. But that was not true. So I realized that women were exposed to violence all the time. I had not learned. I, ha I didn't know this term femicide. It is an important thing that Mexico has typified in the code, the femicide, because before that was invisible. Gender-based violence was invisible. Now they had a violence meter in Mexico with femicide at the top. So when I realized this 10 years ago, I deconstructed of counterculture, of knowing what is established and what is the establishment and what are we doing and what benefit are we creating for society. So it was then that I realized that music was a very significant and important voice and that music is the way that I use to communicate with the world and communicate the things that I want to shout to the world, to my fellow students and my friends and my nieces. I have a 14-year-old niece and I'm really, really worried about her because the country where I live, they kill 11 women every single day. So when I see that music, when I realize that music can cross borders, I make these sorts of songs that speak about what happens that many times are uncomfortable, but are definitely necessary because we believe that Latin America's social music is not alive. Quite the contrary. I think many of us, many of the people I'm working with, they're all worried for this change. They worry about this social change. In Mexico, women suffer great deals of violence and social leaders suffer a lot. Women that take care of rivers and territories, the men that fight against the destruction of forests and jungles, and they are killed for social and political and economic convenience. So yes, we do realize that music can move people and change people. I realized this with uh, Cancion Sin Miedo, Song Without Fear, that talks about femicide. and demands justice, and I think that we can move the world with the art. These marches, these movements, these demonstrations, these people now tell me this song was very great, and now I call myself a feminist. Thanks to this song, I went out for the first time to demonstrate. For the first time, I criticized from home even the men that before said, oh, they're feminazis and they're crazy and they're scratching the walls. But after my song, they say, I have now realized that there's a reason. And so when you realize that you have a voice and that you have to use it, that's what I feel. We have to use our voices and put it to the service of our communities. Thank you very much. You've touched on many important matters of identity. 
but I'd also like to take advantage of this time to make sure that we can hear from everybody. Let me please invite Ukoi. Oh, guys, welcome, oh, Annalise and Jogin. It's, it's a pleasure to, to have you with us today. Welcome. Greetings. Right, uh, I, I just want to tell you, uh, because people don't know much about you, you come from Johannesburg, South Africa, and Ukoi um, is a live Sorry, looping... we, we don't have any audio. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. All right, okay. So I'll just tell everyone that uh, Ukoi Koi is a live looping musical performance art showpiece encompassing multilingual expressions through opera, indigenous chants, and praise poetry using a variety of traditional and contemporary instruments to create their unique Afro-futuristic uh, sound that is rooted in the past, existing in the present, and channeling the future of Africa from their submission. These guys have such a wonderful energy. And um, I, wanna, I just want to go to the point, because we don't have much time. Um, for, us, for us and for everybody in general, is, you know, somehow, somehow, sometimes it's hard to put ourselves in someone else's shoes mostly when they come from a different, a complete different ba background. Uh, and it's, it's hard to imagine ourselves how, to be, how it is to be a musician um, in another part of the world to create your own path musically and personally. Uh, so for you, that same question is what brought you to, to become Ukoi Koi? Um, I guess music is something that uh, I grew up with and I've been learning for most of my life and but I, I really started when I went to university um, and it was quite a long journey of doing um, theater work and all kinds of different musical things some bands some jazz some African music a whole lot of different kinds of stuff until eventually I did meet an Eliza who brings her own kind of uniqueness and authenticity and together we found ourselves creating this very uh, original kind of um, diverse music that does talk of social transformation and stands up for many different kinds of social ills as well. Mm -hmm. From my side, um, Annelisa, I come from a small village in Stexbridge, Eastern Cape in South Africa. Uh, both my parents were vocalists and choral music. Uh, I got influenced by musical chants in a traditional way where um, uh, there was traditional music. And I learned um, opera, uh, classical music in high school, which I felt like was a lot for me. Then I started creating my own way of interpreting opera, choral music, and indigenous music to make it one. So I am the rule breaker of skills when it comes to my artistry. And music has been around me and art has always followed me. And this is how I am and this is how I met Yogi through uh, collaborations and started forming a group that is going to speak of social ills, awareness, and also to spread love and positivity in terms of different kinds of difficulties around the world and mostly here in Africa, especially in South Africa, where we face gender-based violence as women where there is killings of uh, the LGBTI plus Q community and discriminating, discrimination of people of color and black people are all around the world. Thank you very much. In fact, I would like to come back to this point that you've mentioned and that Viviana mentioned. How do we find who we are as artists? in this context of social mobilization. I think that this search for identity is very important. I'd like to talk about social identity and this self-conception that each individual has as to who he or she is, the groups that we belong to, the groups that we identify with, and also our self-esteem. So in simple words, Identity is determined when people decide what place they occupy in society. And that's why it's so important to speak with you as artists. I would like to hand over to Adriana Liscano. Adriana Liscano is another empowered female. She's a point of reference for the social protests that we've had here in Colombia. I don't want to say any more because we don't have so much time. You are also a, a lawyer. You have a master's degree in human rights. Adriana, I'd like to ask you something. How can you 
perform or sorry create art in these moments of trauma for example in the context of protest how can you actually reach people at these times thank you very much for the invitation to be here with you it is a great honor to be sharing this panel with such esteemed guests music is a need it's a, that we all need, no? We live in a country that is in constant crisis when it comes to human rights, a country in which, unfortunately, my all the way from my grandparents up to my grandparents and uh, great-grandparents lived through conflict. So this conflict has existed for more than 500 years in Colombia. Artists and people who through what they do want to kind of remediate these situations. I think we do this because of a need that we feel because we live deeply immersed in these realities where, you know, your your neighbors disappear. They, we see displacement of people. So I think we just respond in the best way that we know how. Everybody should have this sensitivity and this ability because we all live here. But it's easier for some of us than others to feel this because we are closer to this suffering regardless of whether or not we are the ones to personally receive blows. So it's a way to do something because we raise our voices. It's the only way that we know how to do things. I'd like to compliment what you have said. I followed you during the months of protest. In many of the four that you participated in, um, you spoke about this. I think it's the most logical answer. The answer is that you use your artistic voice to reach people. Thank you very much, Adriana. I'd also like to introduce our next guest because time uh, continues to run away from us. I would like to hear from El Linajes Originarios. We met this, this group in 2016 in the eastern part of Colombia, a, a rap and hip hop a meeting that was sponsored by an Austrian brand and so a whole bunch of interesting stuff happening there and just yesterday we were talking about limits both physical and symbolic limits or borders so Kathy James I think spoke in an interview about a uh, Sorry, Katie James, who is the Colombian Anglo singer, Irish singer, who joined us a few days ago. She's always felt like she's in between places because here she's the Irish girl and back there she is the Colombian girl. So I'd like to talk about the cultural identity that you have. There's no better example of breaking down barriers than you. We have Valparaiso Antioquia presented as well as Embera representatives, and you've really taken on ownership of rap and hip-hop. No, there's nothing more Western than rap and hip-hop, but you've made it your own. And you're improving and creating a cultural identity in your local community. So welcome, guys. I'd like to ask you something, speaking specifically about cultural identity. What is this set of particularities that bring us together as peoples? Language, traditions, beliefs, customs, even how people behave. Was it difficult at the beginning? What did the community think of you? Please excuse me for my Western way of seeing things. So, please help me to understand and please help all of our guests to to understand this. What's your experience been like? How has the hip-hop community received you? Have you had clashes? Have you been able to make people more aware of your ethnic backgrounds? Tell us a little more. A very good morning to you all, or good afternoon almost. We are very, very happy, very pleased to be here sharing this space with you. To be honest, from the beginning, when we started 
to do rap and hip hop in Embera, which is what we call it, it was a little difficult. It was difficult for people to accept us, right? And this has been a question of great interest for many people because it's the first thing people ask us. Were you accepted in the hip hop world? Or what happened, you know, in your community? Did the elders accept you, young people, etc.? So that was a little difficult because many uh, elders said, what are these kids doing? They're going out into the Western world and playing modern music. It's not indigenous music. So, so we started to compose a number of songs that were also a gift or more than anything, I would say a gift for our people. Not just for our people, but other eth indigenous communities. And so, they were really excited, our elders, to hear Embera songs being played. And they saw how we were connecting with our roots. It's been a really beautiful experience. A whole bunch of kids all st started to sing. So, uh, really exciting. So, it's been really wonderful. It's a great honor to represent our roots, our people, and our indigenous reserve is really um, pleased because they know that we are representing them and our roots. Thank you so much. So, all of our panelists have created and fostered social identities in society. And through your music and your identities, you have, um, you know, also connected with people involved in social protests. And this is really closely related to um, the feminist platform. The idea is to become part of a group and strengthen this idea of identity. I'd like to go back to Adriana, because I've heard you speak on these topics a lot. And you've spoken about counterculture, that you were going against mainstream culture through your songs, through your lyrics. Could you please tell us a little more about culture and counterculture? I think more than... I've talked about a counterculture revolution rather than counterculture. So it's the time when our country was going through such an evident, uh, violent, and evidently violent situation with a violation of, of rights. It's not a revolution. It is a society resisting certain tendencies. So, of course, the idea is to take power of our words and do what we need to do. We have a culture now where business is supported by violence, where we have drug trafficking that stands out above all else and where women's bodies are also converted into an extension of the narco and paramilitary culture. And we have the presence of armed groups. We also see the violation of rights, and we don't have a proper rule of law. So there are a bunch of cultural elements here that impede change. So when I talk about the cultural counter-revolution, um, and we have 
a great historian who talks about the history of our country, this is what I'm referring to. Art can't not make direct reparations with victims. And so we, of course, have the case of the falsos positivos and also thousands of disappeared people in the country. However, when it comes to, we need to transform these cultural imaginations and we need to make changes. We have a society that no longer feels pain, that's become insensitive. And we've seen many cases of violations of human rights by the state. In fact, there is a truth commission. We also have a search unit looking for disappeared people. But when we show uh, these lost bodies to the public, they don't care because there is psychological manipulation that impedes us fighting back against this. So what we want to do is to get people to feel again and feel this commiseration. We want people to really exist once again. We want people to live lives, dignified lives, worthy of respect. And that's what art does. And that's why it is the best way to get rid of such manipulation. I'd like to name what you are referring to. You're saying that you want to see a general awakening of conscience. As artists, we can create social and cultural identities. You want to awaken people's consciences, no? So uh, the, the lyrics to your songs, this symbolic vehicle that manages to awaken people's awareness. Just a few minutes ago, we were hearing from our guest from Chile who spoke about how culture was something that was very complex when it comes to understanding it. And he spoke about different dimensions, areas, and layers uh, of cultural model for Latin America. And you, as symbols, when it comes to the creation of cultural symbols, you've achieved some important points here. I'd like to talk a great deal more about a many, great many things, but we have a very short time available. We've been speaking with Adriana and with all of you, but I'd like to talk about how we can move from resistance to re-existence. Resistance is something contested, but after everything that has happened, and when we can see things in the cold light of day, we realize that we have to reinvent ourselves. We have to have a social transformation through music. And yes, social fabric. We have to rebuild this social fabric, looking at our messages and our music. Because we don't have so much time left, I'd like to speak with Con Vivir and I'd like to speak with Vivir and hear about how your music and I'd like to hear about how you've worked with different collectives and how you have weaved. Have you been able to build social fabric through what you do with your art? Yes, because you realize it's marvelous because you see that music actually works to bring people together and to demand rights or justice. I went to sing at the Special Prosecutor's Office for Femicides just a couple of weeks ago, and I met many mothers here. Um, I came across many mothers because really it's mothers, women who look for their lost daughters above all else. It doesn't mean that there are no fathers looking for their daughters or men looking for these lost women, but more than anything, it's mothers. And so they, I also met women who have survived femicides and they told me how my song had empowered them so much that they w were seeking justice and a just sentence and also an exemplary sentencing, which is what we are after here in Mexico for femicides. I have realized 
that if you go to YouTube, for example, and you look for Cancion Sin Miedo, Words Without Fear, it's been translated into many languages, many dialects, even in Colombia. Uh, I think there is an actually an Embera translation. And there are videos of many of my sisters singing this song and making it their own. It's to bring people together. And it's also to go out and raise our voices. The more of us who bring our voices to this choir, the more they will listen to us. And we will have people going out to the street and taking action. The other day, a 14-year-old girl said to me, thanks to this song, um, thanks to this song, Cancion Simiel, Song Without Fear, I was able to report my aggressor. That's my father who abuses me. And so, it's not I want to be heard, I want to be seen, but I want to be seen. I think that our strongest tool, the strongest tool at our disposal is our voice. And in, I think in Latin America, we are brought together by a hunger for justice. And as women, we will look for this justice through music. Our musical context, in fact, this was the topic uh, of the first day of the seminar was this, education for today and tomorrow. So these economic-based educations, um, it's not sustainable. We're all looking to improve our living conditions. Okay, I think we are at the end of our time. But we want to hear from Linaje Originarios, who has such an important message. But this should not this construction should not be imposed, this social transformation. This should be a collective construction like what we're doing here right now in this seminar through this panel. And where uh, music becomes a tool to use silence for real reinvention and social transformation, not only in Colombia, but in the world. So thank you to Uikoikoi, Adriana, Vivir, Linaje Originarios. Unfortunately, we don't have much time left, but I'd like to hand over to Linaje Originarios because they are going to launch one of the new songs here as part of the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who also joined us through the screens. Hi. Good afternoon to all the people that are joining us on the link. Thank you for being here. In the second round of youth dialogues, we're sorry about the delay. We were waiting for a couple of girls that were joining us in person in the auditorium. So we'll now begin because we will uh, honor your punctuality. Let me introduce our two moderators of today's session. On the scene, we have Gloria Ramirez, a trombonist from the Philharmonic of Colombia, and an entrepreneur that has worked to strengthen brass music in Colombia called, with a project called the Academy of Brass of Bogota. And she's also worked on gender issues. She co-founded the Femme Brass Association that seeks to include more women in brass music, and virtually, right now, from Brussels. We have Guillermo Rodriguez, Spanish pianist, and an active participant in a project that's called Musica, that seeks to improve the quality of teaching, of music teaching, and you have these two guests will moderate our conversation I will be 
just another participant in the discussion. So I now yield to you, our moderators, so that we may begin. I'll let you know we're going to go on until four in the afternoon, just after four. At that time, other people will join us from the other dialogue on peace building and the role of musicians so that we can clu conclude these very important talks that we're having as young people. Then we will have 10 minutes to share the two groups' conclusions. Just to close these activities and at 4.30 in the afternoon Irene Liftak will and myself we will present the conclusions. Gloria Guillermo, welcome and thank you for joining us. Juan, thank you for your presentation. And it's very interesting that we young people are included in this very significant topics. We begin this conversation with Guillermo. I hand over to you. The interpreter apologizes, sound quality is very low. And to thank Juan for inviting us to moderate this panel, I should say that the first time I spoke to Gloria, the first I said was that I was very excited about this topic and literally said, what am I doing, a white European Spaniard, talking about gender equity and diversity? But I do believe that as a topic that is relevant for all society, and regardless of my case, for example, the privilege I've had and the opportunities I've had, we should all have the rights to access to education and our artistic activity in this case. So, yeah, and that it does not depend on other factors, and we that are in this position of privilege so that we can have the capacity to help. Having said that, I would like our guests to introduce yourselves just to know who we're talking to. We're very few. So let's be a little more familiar. So if you can say your names and where you are and a brief summary of what you do, and then we'll begin with our discussion itself. I don't know who would like to begin. Laura, perhaps. Hi, Guillermo. My name is Laura Navarrete. I'm in Bogota. I'm a clarinetist from the National University of Colombia. I organize a research project called the Clarinet Interpretation Seminar. And recently, together with other female musicians, we started a collective group that deals with feminist topics that works against violence towards women within our industry. It's called Resonantes. Paula. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all male and female people that are joining us. I am in Hamburg. I play the double bass that has been historically attributed to men. And so, yes, I have suffered a number of instances of discrimination due to the fact that I'm a woman and now I am in a number of groups with women 
in Germany, and my focus in my career is women in music today. Katie. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you, Guillermo. And thank you to all our colleagues. I'm Heidi Montes. I'm a percussionist, which is very rare for a woman to play the percussion. I'm also a business administrator, and I am the only female that is part of the planning committee of an orchestra here in the city of Cartagena on the Atlantic coast of Colombia. So, yeah, we're trying to defend my voice and make myself heard as a woman to boost this great project that we have in this Caribbean region of the country. Thank you. I don't know if Anna Maria and Sandra can hear us because their video feed was not working. In the meantime, Beth, I don't know if you have translation. Beth, can you understand what I say? Beth? Hi, Beth. How are you? This is Juan. Hello. <laughs> I'm well, thank you. Sorry, I was late. I am, um, yeah, I think I got the wrong timings, but I am here now and it's really fantastic to be here and to see you all. Thanks for having me. No worry. Thank you for joining us from England. Thank you, you all that are in Europe. I know it's quite late there, but I'm going to send you a link here in Zoom so you can hear the translation, okay? Into Thank English. you. That's great. Okay. Perfect. I, I don't know if she has to leave the conversation. If not, maybe you can introduce yourself. Just say that you come from England and, and a bit of why you are here. Yeah, um, so my name is Beth Hyam Edwards and I am from England. I'm currently in London where, as you can see, it is night time. Um, <laughs> and I play percussion and drums, so I'm a performer. Um, but I also do lots of other um, work in music in London and actually in the UK in general uh, within music education. So I teach and I lead workshops and I work with lots of different musical organisations. And I also um, have done lots of work about gender advocacy for instrumentalists. So mainly focusing on the instruments that in my country are um, male dominated or have um, cultures which um, can be challenging to women. So percussion is one of those instruments and also brass and sometimes other instruments like double bass as well. Um, so I've uh, been doing some work around that with various organisations in the UK and I'm soon going to be launching my own group specifically advocating for gender equality for instrumentalists, um, which I'm launching in November. So yeah, that's why I'm here and looking forward to hear, hearing from everyone else. So thank you for having me. Great, thanks. Let me give you a brief explanation of how we'll distribute time. For the first hour, we'll discuss diversity, and the second half, we'll discuss gender equality. We'll now play a video that will place this in the context, and then we'll start debate, which is the really interesting bit. And then, and gender equality, the dynamic is going to be the same. We'll present some information and some practical issues. Now, let's talk about diversity. Before playing the video, I would like you to see this book that I have here. I don't know if you can see it. I'll send you a link, a number of links to deep go deeper into the information that we're going to discuss today. This is called the European Agenda for Music. This is like a Bible for me in Europe. Right now, regarding music, it was created by a number of sector experts and it gathers information on short and long-term objectives in the industry of music. One of these main objectives is diversity. So when you Get the link with the full text. It's a very easy read. 
So let's uh, watch the video. It's about three minutes. So it will give us tools to discuss later on. It's easy to put people in boxes. There's us, and there's them. The high earners, and those just getting by. Those we trust, and those we try to avoid. There's the new Danes, and those who've always been here. The people from the countryside, and those who've never seen a cow. The religious, and the self-confident. There are those we share something with, and those we don't share anything with. Welcome. Jeg kommer til at stille jer nogle spørgsmål i dag. Nogle af dem kan godt være lidt personlige, men jeg håber, I vil svare ærligt på dem. Hvem herinde i rummet var klassens klog? Hvem er bonusforældre? And then suddenly, there's us. We who believe in life after death. We who've seen UFOs. And all of us who love to dance. We who've been bullied. And we who've bullied others. And then there's us, the lucky ones who've had sex this past week. We who are broken hearted. We who are madly in love. We who feel lonely. We who are bisexual. And we who acknowledge the courage of others. We who have found the meaning of life. And we who have saved lives. And then there's all of us who just love Denmark. So maybe there's more that brings us together than we think. TV2 Denmark. All that we share. Excellent. So that video for me uh, talks quite a lot about diversity, which means appreciating difference, but also looking at what we have in common. And I think that diversity is a term that always has to be linked and we can talk about this later on if you have a different opinion, but I think it always has to look at inclusion. When it comes to diversity, we can talk about a great many things. We could talk about different aspects of diversity. We could talk about diversity of creation, diversity of audiences. We could talk about diversities of um, funding diversity, looking at how artists are financed. But I think we could get into two more topics here. Let's talk about ethnic diversity, minority groups. And I'd like to hear about less represented groups. So, Gloria, if you're here, something important, logistically speaking, is that uh, let's just make sure that we're paying attention to Zoom and that people raise their hands in Zoom. We'd like to hear about your contexts. Let's hear about whether or not you think your spaces, your musical spaces are safe and for diversity and if they are diverse. We're here to have a dialogue, so we'd love to hear from you. If anyone would like to speak, please go ahead. Whoever wants to break the ice, that's always the hardest bit. Paula. 
Okay. I think this is a fantastic matter to start with, that of ethnicity. Let me talk about orchestras as well as the situation at my own center. I'm doing my bachelor's degree here in Hamburg. And we have thousands of students from over 40 different countries. Now, the, I'm very lucky to be with all these different nationalities in one same center. And the fact that everything brings us, we're all brought together on music. And I see real inclusion as a very difficult option. The natural trend is for people to divide themselves into groups according to origin. And so a real integration is very difficult. And in orchestras, in Germany, around Germany, we have been lucky to receive music, musicians from Latin America, for example, Spain, Italy, Portugal, etc. But we don't really see people f of color, people from Asia, they're a minority. And of course, within the environment in the orchestra, there is no real integration. I'm just going to say that and leave that on the table for you to discuss. Thank you. Anyone else? Our friends in Colombia, what do you feel the situation is in your country? Well, within my reality, in general, there's more participation of males, both in the orchestra and the ensembles. Of course, I remember that I started playing an instrument that was normally associated with men, the percussion. So I started studying, and all my mates were males. I never met a female percussionist. It's a very rare thing. And currently, the orchestra in which I work as a percussionist is a director of planning. There are very few women. We are very few. About 15%. So it's a little bit complicated. I don't know if the women are a little bit insecure or whether somehow it's difficult for women to have trust to participate and propose ideas to the conductor, because normally conductors are male. I don't know if it's that they feel or we feel shy. So I want to share with you that reality. And another thing regarding the minority groups, I feel that there is something very important in respecting the origin of other people when they come and join our orchestras and our groups and our musical environments because I do believe that somehow these groups are attacked. For example, I say this from my own reality, we are here in the coast. We from the coast are very different to the people from the mountains. We're all Colombians, but racially we're very different. Some people from Bogota come to the coast and they call them cachaco, which is a sort of term. And they tease them and they take the stance of differentiation. And that can make people to shy away. So, yes, I would like to invite everyone to be aware of diversity and respect for difference, whether it be gender, origin, or personality. Before we continue, we have discussed with Guillermo this term of markers. 
and you name this discrimination that is perceived when we see difference. So yes, there are a number of markers. For example, there are physical markers when you realize your difference just by watching, seeing, or listening. And that starts creating a barrier. And many people say that we are an inclusive country, but these small differences do create barriers. And the other ones are identity markers, which are things that cannot be seen with the naked eye, gender orientation. Some people still feel insecure about this, and these are barriers that generate inequality. I just want to make these remarks because many people think that this kind of discrimination does not exist and that these kinds of violence do not exist. And so when we look at diversity that exists in our society, we can focus more consciously on our perspectives. Completely agree. We have discussed this, and yeah, I think you can't see the chat conversations. Lady wanted to intervene. Yes, yes. Good afternoon. A warm greeting to all of you. Thank you for this invitation. I would like to contextualize myself. I'm a composer from the National University of Columbia. And from the Latin American context, we had the opportunity to open a space that was called the Latin American Composers of Latin America. And this year, the space focused on the lack of representation of ethnic minorities, including indigenous communities, etc. So this is a, a question I've asked myself many times. And so this network, right now I'm not working as closely with, but to the network, but last year the interpreter apologizes the speed at which the speaker is speaking is way too high. And so from this network includes more academic identities. These are compo female composers that work within academia. And there is no representation from these kinds of people. There are no representation of minority communities. So when I was studying at the conservatoire, this didn't happen either. I can't remember any colleagues that presented themselves that way. And this is something we have asked ourselves. Now, in terms of the academic system and how it works in Colombia, so many times the Afro population lives in the Pacific region of the country, and in Bogota, where I am, we're in the center of the country, and one of the biggest problems is that regions like the Pacific have poor quality of access to education and music, of course, and in other areas of education. So yes, we discuss and we ask ourselves whether they are included in our spaces when our academic spaces come from a tradition that came from Europe and there are important expressions that are far from the European tradition that pertain to the black and indigenous 
traditions that are not represented in our education scheme. So we need to also focus on the fact that they are doing a number of actions that are not being recognized in our academic spaces. And this becomes an elitist sort of position to access education from the conservatoire. So I believe that these are questions that we need to respond to. How are these identities represented in academia? And just to finish, although I mentioned that the most the majority of the black communities live in the Pacific. Some of them have moved to Ota because of violence, and they have moved into the peripheries of the capital. In Bogota, we speak about the social divisions, and so the most deprived areas are where these people arrive. And culture and water is very centralized, and the black communities live in the peripheries. So, yes, this is something that can be also seen in Bogota. Thank you. Yes, we'll also discuss these topics afterwards. Sorry, lady, but um, yeah, about the curriculum and female composers and these sorts of topics. Yes, we will have time to come back to this. Further on, I'm sorry, Gloria, that I skipped you. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we will touch on this topic further on and how on how we want to learn from music and how to think of academia from diversity. Lauda, I hand over to you. I apologize because the place where I am is very noisy. There is a street vendor. I'll yield my turn. So, yeah, we'll listen to Sandra now. Good afternoon, and thank you all for the invitation. I would like to mention that I am a BA in music from the Pedagogical University of Bogotá. And I participate in a number of research groups regarding what students ask themselves in the music department. I think that a very important thing is to look at diversity because we study Western music and we have a very high cultural and musical richness. Every region has rhythms and musics that fill our lives. And then we leave this context and then we get to the city and we start learning what academia offers to us. When we focus on the questions that our students ask in their research projects, we go back to tradition, we go back to Colombian rhythms, we go back to European music, we go back to academia, conservatoires. And so these questions start arising. They want to go back home in a certain way go back home to their music, to their origins, go back to how they question life, how to make their territories visible. So I wanted to touch on that topic, which I think is very important from diversity. What we evidence through our research, what we want to share from this department, because clearly these are things that many times are overlooked, for example, to look and dissect the music of the territory. It also conditions the ideas of the teachers throughout the country. So I 
wanted to contribute that. Sandra, thank you very much. This is great because what you just mentioned is the next topic that we will deal with today. So you did the perfect decision. So we want to focus now on diversity with respect to people, minority groups, and on the other hand, <clears throat> diversity on curricula at study centers, in orchestras, and programming. If you always do music from the same Western composers, then that's not inclusion. So it's very interesting to hear your comments from that perspective. I don't know if Laura and Paula, if they want to talk about the curriculum, it's all connected. So at the end, we can delve into other topics as well. Okay, I hope you can listen. You can hear me well now. If Paula wants to intervene too, I think we have a number of points already and I don't want to talk about the same. Yes, but all contributions are valuable, so all topics are related. Now, regarding the question, I feel that I cannot discuss what happens in Europe regarding the students, because in Colombia, the majority of people, we are Colombians, regarding ethnicity. But there is indeed a dire problem of class division. So at the conservatoire, people come in. For example, I come from a public university, and people come that must assume the cost of the instrument. And so that's when the foundations in my country, the interpreter apologizes, sound quality is low. Asking a person to purchase an instrument is a little bit diff more difficult. So, at an academia, we are a little bit more heterogeneous due to this economic inequality that we live in Colombia. That, on the one hand, on the other hand, I would like to mention my point of view as a woman. The clarinet is not an instrument that historically has seen as a female instrument, but in Colombia, surprisingly, clarinetists, female clarinetists are at 7%, and in town and village bands, it's 90%. In primary education, secondary education, there are lots of women studying clarinet, but in university education, not so very many women. So this inequality is due to a number of types of violence that girls suffer in that transition because they're female. Yes, that's also a key aspect, of course, and is, is also part of what you can actually read about on our agenda. Paula, yes, this has all been very interesting. Thank you, everybody. I'd like to talk a little bit about opportunities, classism, educational access, even geographic issues, no? Who lives in the center of the city, who lives in the outskirts? Uh, I have a Chilean composer colleague and He was, he's a member of the Mapuche tribe. I hope I've pronounced that name properly. And of course, his access to musical education, it was not at all easy. He, 
fortunately had uh, some <coughs> extended family members who were teachers at the university in Santiago, and so he was able to access the interpreter apologizes, the audio is being interrupted, but he was able to then enter the conservatory, but unfortunately we don't see a lot of diversity. Um, we need to ask ourselves why. One thing is discrimination, but also we have to think about difficulties and opportunities for people to get where they've gotten to. And that's at the example of Bogota. We've already spoken about this a little bit. There's the economic issue, you know, purchasing instruments. I think we'll come back to that later. Where is there a school that we can go to to study? Um, so, we do have a conservatory. I had no issues accessing, but I don't know what that's about in, well, what that's like in Latin America. Um, I don't know how this plays out with kids. We need to look at traditional music and everything that's unique to every country's culture. And that's a real shame. We need to ensure diversity amongst musicians, but also the music that we consume, that we listen to. I think it's a real shame not to have proper diversity. There's so much music that you have in Latin America that we don't have access to. We have traditional Chilean music that's being incorporated into modern music with typical folk rhythms from Chile and we of course need to focus on these composers but between Spain and Latin America yes it would be interesting for us to be able to access, um, for example, um, folk composers in Latin America. That would be fantastic. And I wanted to ask something else, but I've lost my train of thought. The economic issue, no? Uh, classism. Is there government support? Is there institutional or foundational support to that, that actually facilitate this access or is there not? There isn't a great deal. Guillermo, are you making faces? I think you're making, yes. I guess you'll, you'll comment now. But the point is to look at what's happening. I apologize. Claudia, it's interesting. We've heard comments, you know, maybe in Europe it's different, maybe it's, maybe in Colombia it's different, but when I started to talk to Guillermo, uh, we saw that there are uh, many positive and negative things in common. So when we look at the gender graphs, we'll see that this is something that happens to all youths. And this is not um, just a territorial issue. It's actually very systematic. And so before, before we talk about gender, the point is how can we respond to these issues that we've put on the table, looking at our perspectives or projects, responding to these kinds of diversities. If anybody would like to add anything else, please feel free. Okay, Laura? Yes, let's all connect later on and complete this. 
I think that Laura looking at what I can do I think that at this point the most important jurisdiction that I have is my own I think the only thing that I can do is really take action through the repertoire that I play and you know I don't only play a white European repertoire I really like to look for music composed in my own country especially music written by women maybe I'm not changing the world but um, it's really contributed to my growth as an artist I have another project and in my project there's also a great variety uh, or diversity when it comes to gender diversity and in that project they're all students I think that uh, really it's questioning is my own resistance first of all I must think about what I do and question what I do okay Lady and Sandra both wanted to speak I think let's make sure that um that we keep it brief please because we do need to move on to the next topic I've been very focused on traditional music for some years now and that has led to a movement um, that I have been including like let's say anti-colonial thinking it's very important that we think from a territorial perspective so I work a lot on this front even when it comes to access to pop music yeah, well, I reflect all this my own music however over time I've been reflecting on what it means I've forgotten the word but of course we need to ensure that we are always being anti-racist and feminist in our actions and I think that that is very important when we think about representations and identities it's very complex because I play traditional music and I especially focus on traditional Afro music but I also have to question my own privileges when it comes to the representativity no what does it mean when I play these songs so I went to a competition in the Pacific region with different singer-songwriters and I came in in second place I actually came out ahead of some local artists that was quite surprising for me because at the end of the day obviously the juries were objectives however this leads to a whole discussion when it comes to awareness of what I'm doing with mom with my music because I'm including many identities and what impact is this having on these communities if this alludes to different musical representations the idea would be to not offend anyone at all by participating in this music and of course I want to really focus on problems in these um, specific areas I do look to address these colonial issues in my music and I also like to include different minorities and diversities connecting with people and Lastly, because I know that I need to wrap up, I believe personally, and I agree that calling um, women a minority is 
is a great era because, you know, we are half of the population and I think that's a mistake. That's not the right way to look at things. Thank you. When we talk about minority groups, we're not talking about women. We're talking about Yes. Yes. So I have reflected on women. Yes. Yes, okay, I understand. I understood something different. I thought we were calling uh, women minorities. We have a new guest here up on stage with us. Susana, I'd like to... Susana Borial is an orchestra conductor here in Medellin. And Susana has re recently worked with young people as part of the social protests we've seen in Colombia. She's here to join us for this gender session. So I'd like to invite Susana and also uh, get her to introduce herself. Um, you know, it's all, all female apart from Guillermo and I. I want to say that because, you know, we shouldn't always focus on male participation. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, now I can. Hi, good afternoon. Everybody. Yes. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I am Susana Borial. I am an orchestra conductor as well as an activist looking at social activism at this very important moment for our country. I'm very grateful for this invitation to participate, above all, in these dialogues. Music has always been elitist and classist, especially academic, in academic settings, but it also has a historical debt with women that we can see. There are orchestras that until a very short time ago didn't accept women as permanent members. Now that I chose to become an orchestra conductor, it's very strange or unusual to see a woman heading up an orchestra. Women have always been relegated to, for example, choral direction, or other instruments that are considered to be more appropriate for women because they require more sensitivity or are considered more feminine. So I think it's extremely important when it comes to inclusion in a country such as Colombia that is so diverse but also so problematic where we have exclusion and discrimination um, and certain prejudice, it's important to talk about this. I don't know what else you've been speaking about. Perhaps you could continue to speak and then I can catch up with you. Okay, so this is a very short activity. And um, you can all, let's uh, play the game uh, Never Have I Ever. And when we play Never Have I Ever, it, you know, it's like when you play with your friends, you say really silly things like Never Have I Ever Eaten Pizza, but let's carry out this activity. I've never eaten pizza. So if you've never eaten pizza, then you can leave your thumb up or your hand up, and if not, then don't. I've never traveled to Asia. Okay, so I leave my hand up. I've never eaten paella. I've never eaten a tolima tamal. I've never played or danced a fandango. Okay, so this is how it's going to work. So to think about gender, let's carry out some exercises here. I've never played 
I've never played it in orchestra made up only of female members. I've never played an orchestra only made up of male members. I've never been told that I cannot play an instrument because of my gender or my sexual orientation. I've never seen a woman conduct a live orchestra. I've never heard comments such as, no, that instrument's for men or that's for women. I've never heard, for example, you play like a girl or you play like a boy. I've never seen a woman playing the tuba. I've never seen never seen a woman play the concertina in person. I've never heard or played a symphony written by a woman. So sometimes when we're playing, if we were playing this for real, we'd be taking a shot. But uh, in this case, because of the context, let's have a drink of water. Okay. Okay, I think I would have to use my other hand. I've run out of fingers. Yes. It's the 21st century. But we see these things sometimes occurring outside. I've seen women playing tubas, um, or playing the tuba, I should say, on online, but I've never seen that here in a professional space. And one last session, and this is a little more personal, this is for us to reflect upon. I've never felt intimidated by my colleagues because I'm a woman. I've never felt unsafe in a musical setting. I've never felt incapable of playing an instrument because of comments that we made about my gender. And finally, I've never read a gender protocol, okay? So this is something for us to reflect on. When it comes to gender and diversity, it all ends up kind of floating around. We talk a lot about gender, but we don't really think about the impact that it has on our context, and that would be a much bigger observation to make. Let's look at concrete figures. Now let's look at a slide with some figures that will show us two very important studies. One of these is the characterization of symphonic music in Colombia. This was carried out last week. We'll see that resumed or summarized, sorry, in three graphs. Here we can see that n national female invited artists are 33% female. But looking at the permanent members of the symphonic orchestra, 29%, and then in international guest artists are just 20% female. Something we found in common with Guillermo, 1933, that around 50% of professional musicians are women. That was in 1933. So, So that was a pretty equal figure back then. So what's happened now? Um, I went and spoke to Guillermo. We have so many things in common that when we looked at the study, at a study carried out in Spain, it was pretty similar. So let's hear from Guillermo about the Spanish case. Next, please. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, can you see this properly? So now, it's a little fuzzy up on screen, but we're talking here about the percentage of students, music students in Spain. It's actually more than 50% in Ronda. These are more recent figures that both in teaching as well as pre-university studies, the percentage of students who study music, it's actually a greater proportion of women than the men studying music. Can we please go to the next slide so you can see a bit more? And we have our Royal Theatre and the Valenzuela Theatre, the two of the most important ones in the country. And in Teatro Real, in green, we can see works produced by men, and on the other side, uh, works produced by women. And here we have also dance and theatre works. We see the same kind of trend. I mean, the graph says it all, right? Next slide, please. The same thing. 
This is a comparison of festivals, etc. Looking at theatres and different companies that are coordinated at the national level as well as a local and independent orchestras. Well, actually, sorry, those cannot be included because we don't have data on them. <coughs> this is also interesting. It's not about musicians, but rather about artistic direction. So who's actually in charge of these companies and theatres? And we see here that in this case, the percentage, and this has varied very little over the years, it's very disproportionate. Next, please. And so here, we have some comments on data of this type, but related to what we saw before about diversity. I don't know how it works in Colombia, for example, but I tried to access data about where students came from to look at statistic information, but due to protection of personal data, it's impossible to see this kind of information. I think it's very important that we all have this data. Before we start to talk about a topic, unfortunately, it's impossible to get this information. As I said, I will pass you content to complete. I have two examples of best practices. One is from a Spanish musicologist, Ventura, perhaps you know this person. She's a musicologist who started a project a little over a year ago and we will see a map that's very interesting. In fact, I think uh, on the map there are at least four Colombian composers, but we've actually been able to bring together more than 500 female composers. And so it's very interesting and it's quite a fascinating way to look at what's happening in Spain. We are seeing indirectly that many orchestras are actually uh, including a lot of unique female written music, which is very satisfactory. And this is the analysis that I've carried out. When Gloria and I were researching this topic, I found actually a web page that belonged to Beth, who was here just a moment ago. Okay, she's there. Beth, you're still with us. Okay, great. I don't know if you can hear me. Are you able to speak, Beth? Because it would be great to hear from you. Si, yo si los escucho. ¿Me escuchan? Yes. Ah, okay. Sí, me escuchan. Okay, so we have very interesting information about the percentage of women involved here. You explained this a little bit at the beginning, Beth, but perhaps you could give us more detail about your project. Yeah, so um, I started collecting data on how many women there were playing percussion and timpani in professional orchestras in the UK. And the data didn't come back looking so good. Um, I've got it in front of me, so let me just refer to it. So um, I found that of the permanent seats, 90% uh, are held by men for percussion and 95% are held by men for timpani. And I also looked at brass as well because I had a bit of a hunch that it might be a similar story. And this was collected in 2019. This might have changed slightly, uh, but it's all very similar statistics. I think trumpet was 93% male, trombone the same, tuba 100% male, um, and I could go on. It's, it's all very similar. And we have a lot of orchestras in the UK. So this is a lot of seats and positions. And sometimes the same woman would appear twice which slightly skewed the data as well. Um, but what well, I think is quite, I think I've frozen. Oh no, I'm back. Um, I, I work with a lot of female percussionists in the freelance scene. So I don't always say that um, we're underrepresented 
Um, but I think we find it hard to get positions in the salaried uh, orchestras and in conservatoires. We have lost the trans translation. We've lost translation. I'm not sure if Beth is still speaking. Testing. Perhaps we can communicate via the chat. We apologize. There were some technical difficulties and feedback on the translation channel. Is Beth still there? I don't know if she. Can we get Beth back? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes, I would like to share an experience that we had with you. We spoke about this yesterday. Looking at um, <coughs> orchestra direction or conducting. Obviously, since the time that I studied to be an orchestra conductor, I noted this difference. So, when not when I'm up on the podium, but when I'm amongst the musicians, because I'm also a vocalist, it's very easy to notice when we have male versus female conductors. Women are always criticized a great deal when they conduct. And they talk a lot about her as a woman and say what she does. She didn't do a good job. But when it's a male conductor, no one makes these kinds of... There are never comments of this type. Even if there's a bad conductor, people don't make any of these kinds of comments. There are no comments whatsoever. And so something I've realized from this and from my own experience as a conductor at the podium is that women must always demonstrate your capacity to other people. I feel like I have to go on the podium. I am short, I am female, I am young, so I have to demonstrate to all these people they have the strength in me to conduct. And this is very, very patent. Women are dismissed as conductors just for their condition as women. So machismo is just so ingrained in our imagination. We just assume that a certain person is not able just because of certain conditions. And then there is harassment too. And some of the questions that were you, you were asking, I don't think I have ever found a woman that has not faced some sort of harassment, teachers, colleagues. I know that this can be extrapolated to other instances, but specifically discussing this, I think there's a very strong power play, which has become normalized. I personally have gone through this a number of times, actually, and in different ways. And I believe that we need to improve the structure, not just, of course, we need pedagogy that focuses on gender, but we also have to broaden these policies, for example, to the way in which people find the positions in an orchestra or how they organize the structure and the hierarchy within the orchestra, within the academy, without, within the university, because these are things that are especially not related. But if policies are clear, we could end corruption on the one hand, but on the other hand, we could also end with harassment or these power plays to get certain benefits. So we have to focus on pedagogy, structural pedagogy, and gender pedagogy to erase these practices that vulnerate these women. 
I think Paula is next. Yes, I would just like to mention that uh, my experience as a conductor, I don't really have it, but I think that the base problem is that we as women, whether interpreters, composers, conductors, is that from the beginning we are demanded more than a man. We need to demonstrate our value twice, thrice. And so that bar is set so high that it's not just demanding, but we need to physical strength and the spiritual strength to meet those expectations, together with lots of problems, such as discrimination, harassment, insecurities, not having a role model, or reference conductors. So yeah, I think this is a problem within the system and in education in general. Throughout society, the level of expectations that we have to meet to gain the respect of a man is a lot higher. Yes, I want to mention Susana's work. I think it's incredible that she's sitting with us here because I do believe that she's a figure that represents us. And for example, I did have the opportunity while I participated in an orchestra in school to meet Maestra Cecilia Espinosa, who was the first female conductor at Airfit University, to conduct us here in Catana and I had never imagined that there was a female conductor, or that a female conductor could assume that role. So, in this case, I would like to mention one of the things that I undertake as a promise from my gender is that we su should support each other. What she did with uh, political activism and what she achieved, we should always support and socialize this because for us through digital media it's easier we cannot keep silent i can't just say oh so cool so beautiful i laugh at this and i have a little comment that you look at some ridiculous things like for example someone says to to her unopposed your jacket is beautiful. No, no, it's not beautiful. Your hair, your hair is not beautiful. Your jacket is not beautiful. How brave this action that you're taking to participate and to move a whole orchestra and this political activation that we, as Colombians, we should all have. So I do feel that somehow we need to give support to each other, and we need to be really assertive and ambitious because many times when we, you raise your voice, they will tell us that we are hissy, or look at her, she's hysterical, or yeah, surely she has a period. And some things, uh, these are things that you just have to deal with, but I do feel that we are strong enough and that if we do this together, and if we support each other, surely we will gain terrain. So this is something I just wanted to share. Thank you. I wanted to mention this term that we have discussed in paces, and this is positive discrimination. These orchestras, all female orchestras, calls solely for women, women groups. And I remember what you said before, how to change the way to call and summon and hire. What do you think from this perspective? And also to listen to Guille, because I have found many different comments from instrumentalists, and they say, no, okay, 
now all spaces are for women. And this makes us think in two ways, because in another conversation that we had with Irene, precisely, our rapporteur, we were asking, where's the merit? It's not just about being women. When we see auditions of young groups, they also include women, and they're there on their own merit. So I would like to hear your opinion, Guillermo, to, from your position. But what do we think about these spaces solely for women? Let me compliment your question. How to be in one same space that was not thought for women? How to include gender in this and how to discuss these gaps and these inequalities? How to mobilize men towards this position, to your position? There was an, a question also that I want to ask. We have to integrate everyone in this discussion, and that's very important. The question is also for myself. Well, I do have the response in this case, but my question for myself is how do I, myself, how can Juan or anyone bring more people and convince them that this is a problem. Because actually not solving this problem is not beneficial for anyone. I hope we just get the solution. And this is what we're trying here. We're gathering around this topic and discussing. And this is what I do in my everyday life to try from that point of view, through the associations with whom I work, with whom I study, and within my circle to convince people I don't know, Juan, what you think about this. And if the rest have any comments on this, so that next time we are more sitting here, well, I don't know. I would like to hear the women. Susanna, Beth, you all have initiatives. So are they just for females, or how do you involve men? I would like to address the topic of only women's orchestras and groups. I think that it's a complicated issue, but I do believe that humanity has a debt, a historical debt, with a number of groups that have been segregated, that have been discriminated throughout history. Black people, indigenous people, women. A comment like black people are also racist is a comment that discriminates. Because we need to understand that these people have been condemned and submitted into slavery for a number of centuries, and it's in our DNA. Same thing with women. This is a world that has been created by men and has been thought for men. And it's all about men. So if women want a place, we need to become the change. And we need to be strong activities. And this should also be thought by women and for women. And so, I do agree with right now, th this transitional moment where we are towards gender equality, I do agree that there are only female orchestras because discrimination is not a problem that has appeared within orchestras and mixed orchestras. There is still that sort of machoist position it's not that women are good or bad. It's just that we have to give women the opportunity to invite them to be part of the change in music, just to participate in general, to give a true and real opportunity 
and to repay that historical debt that we have. Of course, men can participate too, but I think that men have had it easy, and it's not really your fault. You here, you're very well aware, but you should understand that it's time to step aside and let us as women to decide our own fate, to decide what we need, because nobody knows more about what we need than us, the victims of harassment, of discrimination, of infantilization, what we need and how we need it, we know about that. So men can give us support and boost all these initiatives and also to generate change within the attitudes to make an introspection and evaluate what are my attitudes that I had gained from my experience and from society attacking women. How can I change that? How can I give support to women? And how can I bring about this change in the people around me? Susana, thank you. I don't know if we have any further questions on the chat. Yes, yes, we had Paula and Lady. We have a very short time, so if you can be very brief, please. Yeah, these, I just had some points from the whole conversation, but I'll address only female orchestras and how to attract men to participate, thanks to you that we are here with us. And it's a pity because we do know what our problems are and we do know what our everyday life is and what we need now is for men around us in this world to be aware of this. So I didn't really have the panacea for this issue to include men in debates, in debates like today's, but I do know that we can be more open about what we live in our everyday lives. It is a, a hard topic But working with colleagues from so many different origins, I always discuss, hey, you know, I've had this experience and I've gone through this and I've seen this. And of course you find all your cultural differences. People don't have a clue that this happens here or there. And they didn't really take part in that. Uh, but some other people are very curious and they realize and they become interested so I think that's the greatest action we can take to share our experiences. To talk to men in our lives and just visualize these problems because only we can raise our own voices. But without participation from the whole society, we cannot solve this issue because we are all part of society. And regarding the female-only orchestras, I do agree with Susanna. We are at a point of transition. And it's a way to repay this historical debt. But I don't know if actually that will help us to repay that debt. Maybe it will be more useful to just say, you have discriminated against us in the orchestra. Now, we do not discriminate against you, but we shall impose a number of quotas for women. I don't know what you think about this, but let's say 60% of the orchestra is females and then 40% males, but not just females or males, not just men and women, they should also participate and they should also see what talent we have and what we have to offer. If we just share this with each other, just women, we will never showcase our true talent. But yes, I can understand that 
transitional process. Now, I'm not sure towards the future, and I don't know what actions we should take so that men can understand this. I would love to continue discussing this topic because it's very interesting. I think we're out of time. Juan, we have three minutes. So if you can make an effort, because we had lots of topics that are very broad and we could go on for hours. So it's very important to find a way to get in touch and share information after today. But a little bit, I think that this conclusion that we have reached, if you can share your conclusions in one or two words, what's the takeaway of today's conversation? What's the next step? What would you do? Or what would you like to do? I think Lady has a hand up. No, I would just like to listen to other people's conclusions. Well, I do have an idea. I've thought about marketing. I have been involved in a number of projects. I think that we should do a number of campaigns to bring awareness. Men. What I would do with men is make them understand how we feel for them to sympathize and empathize with the way that we have had inconvenience and difficulties to earn our place and to make our voices heard throughout society and not to be seen just women that perhaps can be judged from their physical aspect or because of the way they dress or uh, attribute that we have. I don't know if campaigns and yes, lots of different brands have started working on diversity, but I remember one campaign that it was like a school for men. I don't know if you saw this. There's a call for men so that they could learn to do the chores of the house. And that's a very good commercial, TV commercial, and a very good campaign that I once saw. Precisely so that men could understand how to fry an egg, how to do the laundry, because, of course, these are things that have been assigned to women as a responsibility, so I believe that through those sorts of campaigns, commercials maybe, we can make our voice heard. Eddie, thank you. You did summarize a number of things that are important towards our conclusions. I would like to thank all the girls that shared with us, Juan and Guille, thank you. To face for facing the situation together with us. We know there's a long process and it's going to be a hard process because we need to start creating new types of diversities. But yeah, these faces do help us build as youngsters that we have to evaluate and that we have to work towards change in these areas. So thank you very much to all our participants. Thank you to the organizations that have fostered this discussion. And so we now move on to the next point of the agenda. We have a couple of minutes before the other group shares their conclusions with us, which is the role of musicians in peace building and strengthening the territories. You can finish your conclusions, the girls on Zoom. What is your takeaway from this session?
Um, I'm happy to speak if you can hear me. Yeah, um, I found it really interesting hearing how these issues are shared internationally and globally. And of course, these are issues that also exist outside of music. They're big societal issues and topics and cultural change is challenging and slow. Um, but I was very inspired listening to everyone here today. And I think one thing I will take away from it is reassurance that um, people like those in this room are doing the work they're doing. And I just think we should keep doing it and keep sharing our experiences um, and get more on board. And when I say more on board, that includes men, includes people of all genders and bring everyone along um, in our journeys is, is what I would say. Thank you, Ed. Thank you so much, Beth. You only have about one minute louder, I think. She had a comment, lady. I want to thank everyone, I would say. Everyone. I want to thank everyone for being here. We need to come together as human beings. Let's think of the greatest oppression system. And this is the economic system. That's all I'm going to say. There is no struggle without a fight against the economic system. That's the true oppressor that oppresses men and women. Nice and short. Lady or other participants, would you like to share anything else? I have a little comment on the last question that I'm thinking about and I'd like to share with you. This comprehension of how understood separatism, exclusive spaces for women, and how this historical debt and the the interpreter apologizes. We're having sound issues. And so one of my reflections then was to share with my male colleagues. And I we we did have a conversation and we reached we ended up publishing a document asking where are the females in jazz in Colombia. So this asks about the role of women in this and so I th the interpreter apologizes. There they start and the I think we need to generate conversations like these and even discord and conflict, of course, without violence. But to generate these sorts of conversations is very important within all frameworks to reach conclusions that can reach us all and give us more perspective. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else has any comments. Yes, I have something. Oh, clearly, this is a very sensitive issue. As a moderator, it's a little bit limited because we have so many things to say, but I do believe that we need to reflect that. So take away, we create these spaces. A number of people leave the session realizing new things that they didn't know. And these spaces for us, for us women, to reimagine us don't exist among men. So we need to build new masculinities, new gender roles. And we need to discuss how this affects men too, because it is real. As Guillet was mentioned, it's not just a female thing, it's also a male thing. And I want to invite all our friends, we will share a document with links and we will begin creating a network 
if we young people unite, we will reach greater results than individually. I don't know who invented that culture is individual. Culture is clearly collective, and we want to build culture, so let's all unite, generate spaces, projects, support to grow together. Okay, so having had these reflections of Guy and Gloria, I would like to invite Natalia and Irene in the other dialogue, the role of young people in peace building and the strengthening of territories. Natalie was the moderator. She is the Dean of the International Program and the Director of Samos Capaces. She will share the other conclusions, the conclusions from the other conversation. Okay, hello. Well, so I have so many things. And then one of the conclusions is that in order to build peace, we have to do it collectively. Peace is not about a single president or a single government that is far away. This is something that we all own and is all our responsibility. We talked about the sensitivity of musicians that can be transmitted so that other people can have more empathy with people that undergo conflict, that undergo violence. I'm very emotional by the last conclusion of one of our guests. She mentioned about, she mentioned something about forgiveness. Peace is about forgiveness. And I'm very, very emotional because they're young and I want to apologize to you because it's not fair what's happening in this country. But anyway, peace is the responsibility of everyone. Thank you, Nati. Thank you. So I think we'll close the two sessions, the two groups. So everybody who has connected to the gender group and the the peace building group, please stay with us. Please stay with us for the second international seminar, Music and Social Transformation, held by Fundación Nacional Batuta, celebrating its 30th anniversary, because in just a few minutes, we'll be hearing the general conclusions from the seminar, which I think are very important. The idea is to bring together all of the learnings that we have from this session and to really look at the importance of these youth dialogues <coughs> that we've held over the last days so that we can bring together all of these different young voices that we've heard over the last four days and present these conclusions to the general public via our streaming. So via www.samts.co. Thank you very much for participating in these youth dialogues. And as Guillermo said, this is just the beginning. So we need to continue to organize ourselves, continue having these discussions. And I think above all else, we need to build based on dialogue receiving, diverse opinions, and find solutions together. We are responsible for making change, and this historical debt will only be changed if we actually take on the task of doing so. Thank you very much for being with us. So now let's finish with the final rapporteur's report for the second international seminar for music and social transformation. We'll hear from Juan Marulanda. We will be hearing the report on the youth dialogues that have been led by Irene Liptek and Juan Andres Rojas, director of the Youth Philharmonic Orchestra of Colombia. Juan Carlos is in the United States and he now has the floor. So, with no further ado, I will now read the rapporteur's document for this second international seminar on music and social transformation. 
So the first day, we heard the welcoming remarks from our directors, from Gracie Fuentes, Secretary of Culture for the City Hall of Ibagué, and Maria Claudia Parias, who is the Executive Director of Fundación Nacional Batuta. So we provided the general context for the event, looking at the meaning of music in our times and looking at what will happen beyond the pandemic. The first day was based on musical education. We opened with the panel New Ways of Teaching, and we had creative music workshops, well, joining with a drama and theatre and music school in London. And we heard from the Royal Northern College of Music of Manchester, also in the UK, and also musical experiences from New York University. The moderator brought together the importance of planning, collaboration, participation, and leadership in order to reach any goals that have been set. In the next two panels, we looked at innovation training, innovative training in music. We looked at the Musical Connections program from the Royal Music Institute, located in New York. And looking at the Ilumina Festival, looking at democratizing access to music in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The idea is to look at how we expand the impact of music beyond concert halls. Further on, we looked at successful experiences as well as inclusion exercises, looking at transformative projects, looking at how to empower communities, not only musicians, looking at respect and inclusion and dignified human life. We also heard from the interpreter, apologizes, there are some audio issues. We heard about the breathing and well-being program for people recovering from COVID-19, led by the National Opera of Britain. In two later panels, we had dialogues with presenters who talked about successful experiences in health and music. We had Livia Susana Siniestra from the Semblanza Project in Guapi, looking at the preservation of musical heritage, particularly focusing at new generations. And we heard from another trio talking about music as a transformative element, looking at how music is not only a source of entertainment, but also leads to transformation and leadership. We then heard testimonials from an ensemble in the Netherlands, looking at native instruments and new technologies. The interpreter apologizes, there are some audio issues. And we also heard the Free Symphonic Orchestra in Kibdo. There are school spaces where training is provided, looking at adapting to non-conventional concert spaces, interdisciplinary work that involves research composition and performance, as is the case with these native instruments. And we also looked at traditional instruments from the Colombian Pacific. On the second day, we spoke about music and musicians. The interpreters apologize, we're having sound issues. Shall we continue? During the second day, we spoke about music and musicians looking at both physical and symbolic borders. We heard from Voz de Movimiento looking at migration in Latin America and how it has been drawn out by migrants. We heard from Laura Paniagua, 
from Costa Rica looking at lyrics that refer to migration in Latin American countries. In the 21st century, we're looking at a new political migrant subject that responds, contests, and also lobbies to defend their rights. The third panel of the day, Festivals on the Borders, gave us the opportunity to hear about Iwage Festival, where we bring together different musical expressions in Colombia and the rest of the world in a meeting point, sort of, for the family. We also heard about Fandango Fronterizo, where the wall that separates the United States and Mexico is a pretext or becomes a pretext for reintegration. We also heard about the Portillo Music Festival in Chile, looking at young musicians who play alongside great maestros. This is also a market space that allows African musicians to relate to musicians from other latitudes. <laughs> we heard from the musical director of the Mediterranean Youth Orchestra and also the composer and singer-songwriter Katie James. We heard about testimonials that we had already had referred to in earlier panels. We heard about the potential of music to be a common language that enables the establishment of links between people. Also, the capacity for surprise and admiration when we have contact with cultures other than our own through music. We heard from the Chineki Foundation We also heard about the Mars Project working with refugees. We heard from Fundación Nacional Batuta, as well as municipal music from Miranda, Cauca. In this panel, it was very interesting to hear about the questioning of how the terms inclusion and diversity are used, when these terms are used with purely political ends in mind. It's about being hospitable to the other and a real genuine connection. We also saw the broad transformational power of music in our society, which even saves lives by taking children and adolescents away from the war. We then had an interview with Lia Gongora, who is a singer and creator of the Canalon School we could hear affinities with other testimonies and experiences shared. Here we can think about also the attention given to vulnerable populations, displaced people, and the construction of spaces for dignified and just treatment. We then closed with the working tables for the UNESCO Creative Cities. We had a representative from Ibagué, which has recently presented its candidature to be part of this Creative Cities Network, Bogotá, Medin, and Valpar. We heard about track records, lines of action, and related projects within the field of music, as well as diverse proposals to carry out joint work. We also heard about convenience and how it's important to make visible these creative cities, learning from the best practices, and also creating distribution networks. And that was the end of the second day. We then heard about Mundo Liquido Virtual, Liquid Virtual World. We heard about music during the pandemic and continued to work on the Creative Cities working groups, as we'll hear in just a moment. Looking at social convergences and so spatial distancing, the role of music during COVID-19 pandemic included presentations where we heard about the use of music during COVID-19 looking at music as a space for solidarity and also we heard about the survey that was carried out in the UK which had respondents from choirs talk about choral practice and how this helped them during COVID-19. These presentations were complemented in a presentation called Carrying Out or Practicing Music in Confinement where we looked at our sound practices particularly in the times of the pandemic. 
Mundo Digital, Digital World Transformative Experience, gave us the opportunity to hear other proposals, looking at innovative creation and creative proposals, looking at how to connect traditional musical practices in Colombia and their origins with the Scottish Ensemble, which transforms the experience of art into a digital surrounding using interactive tools. We also heard from the Global Conservatory, from the Danish Music Academy, looking at online learning through collaboration, at collaboration from different music training institutes located around the world. We then heard from Luke Jenkinson from the Global Music Vault, where we learned about this initiative looking at cutting-edge technology to create musical archives for the next 1,000 years. And this is also coincidentally located right next to the Seed Vault. We then heard about the Creative Cities Working Groups, hearing about the history of music in Ibagué. We went on a tour through Iwage's musical history, looking at the question, why is Iwage considered, considered Colombia's musical city? We heard from our panelists, and we heard about the love for music that we have in this city, which has recently been put forth as a candidate to be included as a creative city in the UNESCO network. We then looked at music confinement and intimacy, and in that panel, we followed the line of thought covered in other earlier panels looking at how music has been used in the COVID-19 pandemic. And we looked at a trilogy of operas created in Chile in response to the Chilean context and situation. And also we looked at culture in courtyards where these spaces were used to play live music for families with scarce resources in Lithuania. We then closed the session, or the day rather, with the Creative Cities Network. In, we had representatives from Frutiar Chile, La Habana, Cuba, Iwagué, Morelia, Mexico, Santo Domingo, in the Dominican Republic, Valparaiso, Chile, and Salvador de Bahia, Brazil. We had a similar dynamic. We heard lines of action and related projects within the musical field. And we also looked at proposals for joint work and experiential exchange. And that was the end of the third day. <coughs> the fourth day opened looking at a hope for a new future music and musicians in building a, a better world. We started with a conference called Making Visible Differences in Contexts of Cultural Diversity, Proposals for Musical Integration, Musical Education that Integrates. This presentation was given by Dr. Poblete. He invited us to reflect on culture and education looking at the complexity of Latin American culture and recognizing the need to open knowledge spaces for inclusion. Looking at the purpose that music serves in society. And we talked later with Mark Bamuthi Joseph, director at John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts in Washington. He talked about how music can truly elevate us and help us to build a better society, inviting us to think about compassion, hope, and inclusion. <clears throat> Mark insisted on the importance of investing in art because beauty will lead to innovation and allow the human race to advance. We then had a musical conversation session, looking at exercises of resistance, and we carried out a historical tour of the military regimes in the 60s to the 80s in Argentina, 
and the conflict in Northern Ireland in the later decades of the 20th century, in both cases looking at the role of rock music as an element of political resistance. While music does not resolve societal problems, it does have sufficient power to produce <coughs> change at important situational moments. We looked at music and social mobilization, voices of protest. We had participation from Vivir from Mexico, Cocoy from South Africa, and also another group from Colombia. These are artists who feel called to help transform society, calling out societal ills and also building identities and providing immense hope for a better future. Which was a great way to conclude this seminar. So on the 1st of October 2021, we came to the end of the second International Seminar on Music and Social Transformation. Also, this coincides with the Fundación Nacional Batuta and its 30th anniversary and the City Hall of Ibagué City Hall. We will now hear the rapporteur's comments on this second International Seminar. Thank you very much. A very good afternoon to you all. Thank you to those of you who've joined us this whole week. We would now like to present our rapporteur's comments on the closed youth dialogue sessions. We've had approximately 35 youths from different parts of Colombia, from all over the country, Puerto Asís, Via Vicencio, Bogotá, Medellín, etc., as well as youths from other companies, Austria, France, Belgium, Spain, and England youths who are concerned about the future of the music and symphonic sector, but also because of the national realities and national contexts. These were very interesting dialogue spaces. I would like to share with you what we touched upon in the first dialogue, and then Irene will tell us about the second dialogue and the different topics that we covered. These youth dialogues were possible thanks to support from our moderators and these young people who decided to be involved in and moderate these panels to cover incredibly deep topics, looking at philosophical and existential topics. So thank you for uh, getting this organized in such a short time. Thank you for having the director of the Global Leaders Program as well as the Somos Capaces Director. I'd also like to thank our Spanish pianist who join us and Gloria Ramirez, who plays in the Youth Philharmonic Orchestra of Colombia and co-founder of the FEMBRAS Association. And also Susana Borial, who was an active participant in the on-site dialogues and also participated. The first dialogue looked at musical education, which we debated extensively in the first seminar. And what we did with the youth group was to look at music in the 21st century, but we looked here <coughs> at the importance of reading context. And so we heard some very troubling, but at the same time inspiring comments. And we looked at a space where we decided that it is truly necessary to have a reform in musical education. We have to be entrepreneurs. We have to carry out social projects, be committed to our communities, and have important perspective on context. Look at what's happening, what music is being played, what musicians are playing for, what types of audiences, how does this tie in with mental health? And so we came to a very interesting conclusion, which was about looking for a more emancipatory method. And so we want to have actors who, through their training, can actually take action. And the idea is to ensure that we have students who can make decisions and know what direction they are taking, looking at the sectoral progress that needs to be made and advancing these decisions. We looked at how we can really light the way for our students, 
so that they can make their own decisions. Looking at new musical groups, new formats, new repertoires, <laughs> and we need to ensure that teaching in conservatories occurs as necessary. <coughs> we also spoke about the importance of getting organized, how young people also are um, preoccupied about unions and trade representation in the musical sector and the different spaces in which they are going to carry out transformation. And finally, in a country that has created so many training spaces for music, with, with more than 86 musical training programs in the country, 40 for symphonic training, what is happening? How are we ensuring quality tertiary education to ensure that young people who play instruments in our country can in fact access professional training and become professional musicians? How can we ensure that that migration we have towards Germany and Austria where conditions are better. How can we prevent this talent drain and offer this quality education in Colombia? And finally, what kind of social causes are musicians committed to? Because that's a very important role to play in our society, to deal with issues that we suffer from not only in Colombia, but in other countries. There are two types of people, those who take action and those who react. And as young people who want to take action, we have to take action. And we've heard again and again in these dialogues, I'm committed to making things better and changing things. Juan, thank you for that quick contextualization of this first dialogue. There are a number of common points in all four dialogues, and I take what you mentioned, reading the context. The second dialogue that we had was focused on creative entrepreneurship of musicians. We started precisely there, reading the context. Where we are and what's happening here in Colombia and around the world, but Centeno, the person that moderated this dialogue, proposed a look to see how many professional musicians there are in the world, and the figure is quite telling. Just in the US in 2010, it hasn't been monitored for a long time, there was over 330,000 professional musicians, alumni, from BA and MA and PhD programs. So what to do when there are so many and there are not so many positions available? So what about entrepreneurship? What about creating opportunities among those needs? So we have lots of very well-trained musicians, but what for? Well, where will they practice music? And I think this is a question that we all should think. Now, the answer is always related to the open answers of our participants with the question, why study music? And the answer was always related to society. Our people always said to transform lives, to give to my community, to make greater empathy. So there is conviction and there is a need. And from that convergence between need and dispositions springs the opportunity for entrepreneurship. One of the m most beautiful conclusions from these dialogues is that creative entrepreneurship is about falling in love with the problem to create the solution. If there's a lack of employment, I will fall in love with that to generate employment in music and in the arts. And another conclusion was that creativity and innovation in creative industries spring, of course, from the interconnections with other disciplines. Some of them can be quite close to music, other fields of art or culture. Some others can be very far away, and there is that we find possibilities to generate positive impact of our, within our communities. Environmentalism, through music, how can I improve environmental action? How to reduce the gap in violence? or gender equality. So we find a number of possibilities to create from our daily actions and our profession. That was what happened in that second dialogue. Irene, thank you. We then move on to the second session that was also related with the topics that were dealt with in the seminar throughout the weekend. I want to share somewhere it's about gender equity and promotion of diversity in music. 
Once again, the context is okay. We are talking about what's happening in England, in Colombia, in Spain, what's happening with diversity. And we mentioned how complex it is sometimes to integrate and to include different nationalities, different forms, different shapes, different programs, what music, who are the people that comprise these orchestras nowadays, and they mentioned, yes, of course, there is great integration of Latin American musicians in European uh, orchestras, but almost no black musicians or no, almost no Asian people. So in spite uh, Erasmus and other programs help these youngsters go to conservatories, how can this reflect on the professional reality and how to generate spaces for inclusion? And in Colombia, we also mentioned the importance if this leitmotif of this conversation, a country with so many processes in the region, these students in these regions, how can we offer them opportunities to generate more inclusion and greater diversity? We also mentioned the diversity of music that we listen to, what kind of music, and who is our public, and how to circulate this Latin American music in Europe, and how to generate that showcase. And there was an interesting conclusion there, and it's questioning resistance. Is that resistance is questioning, how to question things as young people, as musicians, as interpreters, how to question the repertoire, the projects they would participate in. And that's personal and constant question is, questioning is very important towards decolonialization. We looked at gender issues uh, that apply to all the countries. We compared figures between Spain and Colombia. It's in the best case scenario, 70% men, 30 women. But in conservatoires, it's more women. So we have to work on structural pedagogy, gender pedagogy, and that idea that women must always justify their role in society, so how to reach that gender equity with reference points. How can women move forward if we have no reference points and no role models, no bass players, no female conductors, no tuba players, how to generate these sorority spaces towards support, how to make this permeate all genders and all society and how to share these experiences that have had positive effects in England and other European countries and how to create a conversation to repay that historical debt regarding diversity and gender. Indeed, this is very important because music allows us to integrate. That is one of the general conclusions throughout the seminar and throughout all the panels that we have listened to and all our speakers. Through music, we can find our similarities in spite of our difference and thanks to our differences. And this takes me to the last dialogue that was music and peace building moderated by Natalia Jimenez. From Puerto Mayo to Paris, we had participants giving their insights on how to build peace and how co to contribute to peace. What is peace? What is conflict? What is violence? So that was our starting point. So some of our participants shared these conclusions. Peace is not just the absence of violence. It's the promotion of human rights. There are different types of peace. My peace is not the same as that of someone that has gone through conflict. It's social stability. For peace to exist, equity is necessary. These pieces are collective and evolutionary processes. We're all responsible for this, from our, the smallest actions. And this is very relevant because regarding music, again, music gives us empathy, sensitivity, placing ourselves in other people's shoes, and how to build with small actions in our everyday life, how to integrate and recognize mutual differences and mutual similarities. Another thing that was important in this dialogue is that conflict is the structural base of our society. We can all be 
and disagreement, but violence or peace are the ways in which we resolve those conflicts. And there was a phrase that I want to use to close this dialogue. Vincent Fee says, peace is the ultimate face of conflict. It's the way societies and people transform conflict in a creative and positive and nonviolent way. If we can't do this through art, I don't know how we can do this. But I think art is a way to resolve our conflict peacefully and creatively. As artists, as musicians, we should contribute to reintegrate and rebuild our social fabric. Yes, I agree. We had participation from young people aged 17 to 35 from different regions of the world. And this was the final conclusion of many similar solutions. And it is all a call to the ecosystem in general. This is not a conversation. And that's it. This space is important because in the end we have to permeate many institutions that we work with towards peace and integration. Another conclusion that we want to mention today is that these spaces for dialogue, we need more of these. And many people, many guests did not come. What can we do? There have been so few spaces that not many people understand their importance and so we want to invite you all to foster these spaces and to understand why these are important towards sustainability and the future of our path as artists and as musicians. If we do not reflect on these very significant topics, we won't be able to know what will happen to our profession in the future or what we'll be able to do regarding social issues. Now, to conclude, the culture of debate, that was the ultimate purpose of this. We needed to discuss from debating and argumentation and positions. It's very nice to take these ideas. And we made commitments from my context, from my reality, from my region. I make a commitment to help and to build. And in the end, it makes me think about the theory of Engelstrom's activity systems, when you integrate an element into the system that has certain characteristics, that system starts transforming. And so the young people that we had in the youth dialogues during this week in the second seminar of Musing Social Transformation have already changed their mentality that will permeate their context, their countries, and they will create new connections and new spaces. We invite all our young guests to participate in these sorts of paces that we continue building things together. And what I mentioned before, that historical debt to equity, we will just change together. This is the young people's role. So welcome all to this change. Congratulations to Atuta and his 30th anniversary. And thank you to the Secretary of Culture of Iwage for giving us this space as young people. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for your active participation in this event. We're coming close to the closing of this second international seminar on music and social transformation. Four days are not enough to say all the things that we'd like to say about the strength of music to change the world. However, we hope that the second version of this seminar has opened a possibility for all of us to understand new dynamics of music within society and to take and to value its power as a tool for change. Throughout this week, we have mentioned music education, the relationship between music and territory, music during and after the pandemic, and how music has is an important tool to build a new world from the voice of young people. We've had conferences, academic panels, successful experiences, conversations, and in-depth interviews. Each one of these events that welcomed 88 experts, academics, experts from 24 countries, reached over 1,200 people 
joining us from around the world in this hybrid event that we organize jointly with the Mayor's Office of Iwage and its Secretary of Culture. People that live in cities like New York, Madrid, London, Santiago, Sao Paulo, Berlin, LA, Lima, Rio de Janeiro, Mexico City, Baltimore, and Nairobi joined this event organized by Fondación Nacional Batuta in the framework of its 30th anniversary and by the Secretary of Culture of EOIG in the framework of its soon-to-be inclusion in the Creative Cities Network of Music. This seminar would not have been able to join all these diverse voices without the participation of a distinguished academic committee comprising the following people to whom we express our gratitude for their work in the structuring of concepts and guests. Gretchen Emerson, International Cultural Advisor, and for a number of years, Director of International Relations of the Music and Dance Conservatory of Paris, Haibo Bermudez, Director of the Department of Culture of the Government of the Department of Tolima, James Fernandez, Rector of the Tolima Conservator, Celia Fisher, Director of the IMC, Juan Camilo Giral, the representative of music for the Culture Council of EOIG, Kathy Graham, Director of Music of the British Council, Sylvia Espina, Director of Arts of British Council in Colombia, Angela Maria Perez, Deputy Cultural Director of Banco de la Republica, Juan Rojas Castillo, Executive Director of the Young Philharmonic of Colombia, a project of Fonda, Fundación Bolívar de Venda, Catherine Sorache, Academic Director of Fundación Nacional Batuta, Claudia Toni, Cultural Advisor to the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, and Cesar Sambrano, Maestro Sambrano, Music Director of the University of Salima. In addition to the advisory committee, behind the seminar there is over people that with their hard work have made this event possible to rise to the occasion. I want to thank to Gracie Fuentes, the Secretary of Culture of Yage, for working with her great work team on this event that we hope has become a reference and a motivation and inspiration to dynamize the subsector of music in the city of music. I would like to thank also Claudia Tani, program advisor for the seminar, who worked together with Fundación Nacional Batuta to identify experiences, experts, musicians, and guests, and to build this connection that led us throughout these very intense four days along the path of knowledge. It would be impossible to name every single person that worked so hard so that the seminar could be successful in this hybrid format. I cannot stop thanking Mario Fernando Lopez, manager of the event, Angelica Frasica, general coordinator, Laura Casiblanco and Michel Garcia, production coordinators, Pilar Chacon, Angel Pulido, and Ivan Monevar, and their agency, Shatki, in charge of communications, Alejandro Acosta and Jarre Strunin, our interpreters in charge of translating this very complex event in the virtual and hybrid world. And of course, my good friend, Gonzalo Villalen, and the team of VLON Entertainment for the production and the logistics and digital production for them. Let's have a round of applause. We also thank the Mayor's Office of again, the Secretary of Culture, and all the people on the screen. My admiration to you for making the second version of the International Seminar on Music and Social Transformation to take place in this city and not a different city. From this auditorium, from this auditorium in the University of Tolima, whose workers we also thank. This event was possible thanks to the kind support 
of our associate entities, the Ministry of Culture of Colombia, the Chamber of Commerce of Ioge, Bank of the Republic, Compensar, Fundación Bolivar de Miranda, and its whole project, the Young Philharmonic Orchestra of Colombia, the British Council, and Ego Petrol, and our allied entities, the Embassy of the United States of America in Colombia, Fundación Bavaria, Fundación Bank Colombia, and the University of Tolima. They have participated to those that have participated from all the corners of the world as panelists, guests, participants. Our gratitude for believing in music as a tool for social transformation and for your interest in knowledge. We will now listen to a special greeting from Celia Fischer, director of IMC, regarding today's celebration of the Day of Music and Musicians, and then we will move on to our closing concert. We will listen to Matilda Knox live from this auditorium, and then we will listen to different orchestras from different parts of the world that have joined our closing concert. The Symphony Orchestra of the Conservatory of Tolima, the Entrecantos do it from Iwage, the Children's Symphony Orchestra, Guri Santa Marcelina from Brazil, Basquiat Ensemble from South Africa, the Young Orchestra of Bahia from Brazil, the Free Orchestra of Kibdo, the Young Philharmonic of Colombia, and the Afghanistan National Institute of Music, to whom we dedicate all the contents of this seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today, October 1st, the international music community celebrates International Music Day, as launched by Yon de Binuin, president of the International Music Council in 1975. As secretary general of the International Music Council, let me therefore reiterate on this occasion the words of Yehudi Minuin that music is the language which penetrates most deeply into the human spirit. As the Symposium on Music and Social Transformation so strongly highlights, music is key to development of both international relations and more localized communities. It is with this in mind that the IMC celebrates on this International Music Day the holistic value of music in the lives of all people as an art form, a product, and a tool for social change. The broad range of topics addressed by the Symposium on Music and Social Transformation supports in an exemplary way our IMC vision of a world where everyone can learn, experience, create, perform, and express themselves through music, and where artists are recognized and fairly remunerated for their work. My warmest thanks go to the organizers of the symposium for putting together such an important, insightful, and informative event. Thank you. <laughs> 